All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is Control Camp. This is our Wednesday room. Uh, we are a community of all gathered around sync around the topic of sync licensing, which is placing your music in media that could be film, video, advertisement. Um, and we talk about this every week. We meet every Wednesday here this time, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard. Uh, and it's uh, me, your host, Eric, with uh, Daraj and Steph. The three of us are the co-hosts for the show. And w- between each of us, we have a significant experience in placing, writing, composing music uh, for sync. And every week we come together um, ourselves and we bring some of our friends and associates and sometimes people we're just meeting, but people who are experienced uh, in this space so that we can all share um, our knowledge and uh, we can all kind of level up together. Um, so like I said, Wednesday is our main room. We also, um, every, um, bi-weekly on Saturdays, uh, we do a listening room. So if you, uh, are here, we just did it this past Saturday. So two Saturdays, um, from now, we're going to do another one where you get to come and play a song and we, uh, we and the panel that's there give you feedback on your song from a sync perspective. Uh, you can find out more information about us at controlcamp.com. If you look above my picture on your phone, the Control Camp is spelled out, C-T-R-L Camp. Also right next to that is the, see, that little greenhouse. If you click on that, that'll take you to our club, Control Camp. You can hit follow, and that way you will be notified about all of our events, all of our upcoming rooms, including the very exclusive after party, which happens right after this event uh, starts around 10 o'clock or whenever this room ends, which is usually 10-ish. And uh, that is, you know, you'll see if this is your first time here, you'll see this is a very moderated room. We have, it's a kind of like a TED Talk. We have questions for our panelists. We go, we stay in order. And the second half around nine o'clock, we take questions from the audience and it's, um, it's uh, very moderated and it's, it has a, a very structured, organized flow. And then at 10 o'clock, we kind of let our um, shoulders down and um, anyone can come up on stage. We don't pull anyone up. You just raise your hand and anyone can come, come up and talk. And we um, all kind of get to know one another. We don't talk about sync in that room. We just uh, kind of, it's kind of like hanging out at the bar after a TED Talk. And it's really, really cool because we've gotten to know a lot of our control camp members. But you have to be following the camp in order for that room to show up in your hallway. Uh, So if you're not, hit the greenhouse above my picture and hit follow and then you'll see the room after this. Um... Today, we've got a real, really cool room because normally what we do here is we will normally talk about uh, a lot of more traditional licensing scenarios. So we've, uh, you know, last week, um, I think it was last week, we had um, an advertising, or the week before, I'm getting it mixed up. Recently, we had an advertising room, so we had some advertising supervisors um, talk about how music works. Uh, for ads, we've had uh, music supervisors from CBS Viacom, we've had music supervisors from um, a particular networks or shows, and so we, we've been dealing with a lot of the traditional space, but there is, and it's still emerging, even though it's been here for a few years now, but a lot of people still don't know about it. There is this place where you can write music that is synced to a larger community of of people who are creating video content, primarily YouTubers who, you know, are now Um, video directors, um, making miniseries, writing original stories, documenting weddings, podcasters, all of these, this this is community has needs music, but traditionally this community doesn't have the same budget as a large advertising company or um, a major broadcast network. And so what has ended up making this profitable uh, in spite of that is the fact that it's a large community. So, you know, in sp- instead of getting a huge, you know, $10,000 sync from one company, you might get $1,100 syncs from a, 
a bunch of YouTubers, right? I'm just pulling those numbers up. We're going to talk to our guests and see if those are realistic numbers. But that's the concept, you know, a much larger pool of people um, with smaller sync fees leads to an, an additional stream. And many of us aren't aware of this. This is not a world that I live in. And, um, I, you know, Steph and I talk, it's not a world that either of us lives in. Diraj is in this world. So today, Diraj is kind of uh, with our panelists, with Psychosis and Kickley and Money Cat and Taylor. And so we're going to be asking them questions. And we're going to find out just kind of how um, MicroSync works. So before I jump into it, Steph, any, um, any, uh, any, any other intro or no, I love this because, um, as Eric said, I it's a world I know not much about. So I'm with you all tonight, and we're going to ask a bunch of questions and, you know, get into it. Because this is what this room is all about, figuring it all out together. So let's get in it. Cool. Uh, anything you want to say, Daraj, before we start? Yeah, I think you covered a lot, man. I, I think it's going to be a really cool one because um, everybody who we have on our panel has different experiences with different, um, you know, libraries and agencies um, in this space. And so we'll be able to kind of speak to it, you know, from, you know, where we've, you know, seen successes and, you know, just kind of uh, the lay of the land for those who may not know this as a, um, as an option within the music space. So yeah, I'm, I'm ready to kick it off. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, as we start, and as we said, we're going to first half, we will kind of do questions and then we're going to open this up. So you definitely have a chance to come up and ask questions about this. I would say right from the start that because of the specialized topic, when we get to the Q&A, we will be focusing, we'll be taking questions about this topic. We want to pretty much stay on this um, for the, you know, for as long as there are questions so that all questions get answered because I'm sure we're all curious about it. So let's start this way. Let's, um, let's uh, go around with our panelists and give us, I like to say, give us the 60 second introduction. Um, our, our members can go and, and read your bios for the f full thing on your Instagram, but tell us kind of who you are um, and any quick career highlights you want to mention, and then we're going to jump into our Q&A. And since uh, Psychosis is kind of control camp family, but also panelists, I'm going to start with him. I appreciate it, man. Um, first of all, I want to say I really appreciate the fact that we're having this room and this topic, and I, th I think it's one that uh, everybody in the audience will appreciate, so stick around if you got time, and also ping some of your friends in, let them know to follow control camp. Eric Deraz and Steph, you guys are amazing. Um, and I'm pleased to share the stage with Kick, Money Cat, and Taylor. Um, myself, uh, my name is Eric Roberts. I go formerly in the music industry as Psychosis. Uh, I'm a songwriter, uh, a performing artist, a real estate agent, and an educator. And like many people in the audience, I'm, I'm what I like to call multi hyphenate because it makes me sound important. Um, <laughs> but, but basically that means like, I, you know, I do a lot of different things. You got, you know, a lot of people trying to figure out how to get it into the music industry. And a lot of us are swinging for the home run and hoping that we get one big break. Um, and as Eric kind of already alluded to, uh, in my opinion, micro sync and sync together, uh, are like a million little breaks and they add up to giving you exposure. So, um, I've had placements, uh, on networks like NBC. Um, and I've had placements on video games and YouTube channels and Instagrams and have had similar levels of success of how they panned out. So having a, a big placement on a television show, you know, for bragging rights purposes feels pretty good. Um, but as you mentioned already, Eric, that, that wide range of net, uh, that can be cast, um, for me in particular has, has, uh, done very well for me. Um. Actually, by this time tomorrow, uh, one of my songs called Worship should pass 1 million streams on Spotify. And that's largely due to micro syncs. So not only can you see the benefit from the sync itself and the exposure of having your song placed, but because it's such a large audience and it's international, um, that for me has driven people to become fans of Psychosis after the fact, because they're watching their favorite YouTube influencer post a video and my song is the soundtrack and now no matter where they are in the world germany 
Croatia, Russia, uh, France, you know, South Africa. Now they associate me with one of their heroes and one of their icons in their country and they, they become fans. So um, that's what I see it as. And, and I'm glad to be here to talk about it tonight. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Congratulations on the song Worship, which uh, Psychosis, well, he didn't premiere, but he did play at one of our early um, listening sessions. So I'm, I'm, I'm really glad to see that song blowing up. Uh, all right, let's continue on with Kick Lee. How you doing, man? Give him, tell him about yourself. Hey, um, I'm Kick Lee, uh, founder and actually executive director of an organization here in my hometown of Cincinnati called the Cincinnati Music Accelerator. We are a music career accelerator program focused on educating music creatives on the business side, but we've actually uh, kind of more so evolved more into a, the very thing our, mute, our name carries is a music accelerator by booking talent out to various local and larger opportunities with various large sponsor, large partners um, as well as we do community programming and creative placemaking with mobile stage trailers that we own and have. And we're actually just, we're actually going tomorrow to acquire our own uh, tour bus so we can start getting our tour curriculum going where we will actually provide musicians and music creators the opportunity to learn and physically experience what it's like to be on the road with a uh, up and coming influencer as their opening act so there's that part um but my true day job is music producer composer uh, i make music for primarily marketing and advertising i work with i guess i could say hundreds of brands uh i do this pretty much every day it's usually during around the late evening at uh, night time when i do this stuff uh, just actually lock locked in a contract with Wilson uh, Sporting Goods, which is really huge for me um, because this will be a global project. So pretty much making content music for their uh, collateral and things like that. So I could go on forever, but yeah, I'm focused on helping people in music just accelerate their careers and actually currently now working more to build my city into uh, back into a music city, well, which it should have been in the first place. So yeah. I love that, and I, I noticed that on your um, Instagram today, and probably it's cool that you and also Psychosis have real strong activist um, parts of your your life, and I, um, so I think that's real awesome that you have that in common, and you're, you're here sharing the stage, so welcome. All right, let's continue on. Um, Money Cat, let's give, give us the um, your 60-second intro. What's up, guys? Hi, everyone. Well, I'm Kate. I'm Khalid. And um, we're a band. Yeah. Thanks, Steph and, and Diraj and Eric for having us. This is like such an awesome thing for for, yeah. for everyone. We're for so us. happy to be here. We learned a lot in the last mm -hmm. panel we were on, and we love being a part of this community. It's really, really cool. Yeah. Um, we're a band. Yeah. And but we're also we're music producers and music composers, and we we're songwriters. And we're engaged. And we're engaged. <laughs> yeah. So we love each other, and we love making music together. Uh, most of the thanks, guys. Most of the luck that we've had as far as like, you know, we spent our whole lives just being musicians and, and what, what I always think of is like doing it the hard way. Like we're going out and we're playing for 35 people in a city and then you come back next time and there's 40. You did your job right. Then you come <laughs> back again, there's 47 people at this venue. You know what I mean? And that's a really great way. Um, but there's also this thing that's really been great for us is, you know, you get your song in a commercial and all of a sudden, all of a sudden like, you know, someone's pouring, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars into promoting your song and getting it in front of people's ears so sync has been a really useful tool for us for, for finding fans for finding real fans and and with the micro sync stuff i the reason why it's been really cool it, it i feel like so much of this sync world it's sort of feast or famine so like you know if you get a big spot it's a ton of money but then like those big spots are harder to come by now than they used to be so there's longer periods of time without micro syncs that you would just like not have any income, but it makes the um, peaks and valleys like a little less intense. And also they're usually more um, targeted, you know, like the listeners for those smaller channels are maybe more engaged. So it's, um, you know, they might discover your music yeah. better. So I like mean, Psychosis really, was saying, like, yeah. you know, you hear something in a Tide commercial, you might not run and grab your phone and like Shazam it. If it's on your favorite YouTube channel, you might check it out. Yeah. You know? 
so that's us uh and, and we we love this stuff and we want to be of service because like we were saying we spent so many times or so much time in our life learning things like really the hard way <laughs> so if we can <laughs> if we can share any of this and it helps anybody make a few less mistakes we're here for you yeah totally Love you. I appreciate that. That is your, uh, that is great, and we just appreciate your energy that you always bring. Um, all right, and last but not least, we got Taylor Matthews. How's it going, Taylor? Oh, Taylor, you there? Yeah, there you yeah, are. good man. Sorry, this is my first time using this app, so I'm trying to figure out how it all works. Oh no, well, no worries. Welcome to Clubhouse. I do <laughs> you know did it, you man. Got to... You got it, Taylor. <laughs> I'm in. I'm in. I'm in the matrix. You're in. You're here now. You never let. You, they'll never let you go. <laughs> So cool. Tell us, uh, give us, uh, give us the highlight, career highlights, and uh, let them know who you are, real quick. Cool. So uh, yeah, I started uh, music when I uh, maybe 2010. Um, I was on a show called America's Got Talent, um, and that kind of gave me the uh, the ego boost to move out to Los Angeles. And then it really wasn't until maybe uh, four or five years ago that I really started seeing a uh, spike in the amount of money that I could make. And um, that was primarily due to the microsync world, um, particularly, you know, music bed that uh, we have most of our artists uh, at right now. And, and that started in 2017 with, uh, with one artist. And then um, I started getting into like a knack of like artist development and uh, went from like one artist uh, that wasn't actually my face or my voice um, so I took a complete left turn from what I was actually after in LA and then I moved to Nashville and then kind of, be, you know, became, uh, somewhat of a puppeteer behind brands. Um, and so, uh, we grew from one artist to 10 artists, um, under, uh, the umbrella called Pelican house. Um, it's kind of our pseudo label, our vanity label that we, uh, kind of funnel everything under. Um, and then I've moved into management here recently of, of, uh, helping, uh, sign artists to these licensing houses. Um, if you don't have the patience uh, to do that, or you feel like you know you you uh, you can get caught up in in you know it, some of these people don't respond you know incredibly quickly. So um, you know the 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 terrible world of follow ups and, and discipline it takes. Um, I feel like a lot a lot of times artists are. Uh, you know, such as myself, are, are real easy to jump ship on something, um, you know, before they actually get their chance to to uh, see opportunity, um, you know, come through. So um, I moved into management and uh, I'm kind of helping facilitate, you know, signing some artists to this 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 world. And um, to piggyback on Psychosis's uh, point and, and Money Cat as well as um, the the artists that we signed, um, I've never seen this happen before because, I mean, I spent like I don't know, six, seven years of my, of my own stuff trying to build up, you know, monthly listeners on Spotify and engagement on Apple. Um, and uh, whenever we got into this licensing world, uh, we just found that people that uh, engage on YouTube, engage on uh, Spotify playlisting, um, we just saw so much opportunity, like, you know, t every probably 70 percent of our artists are, are above 30,000 monthly listeners. And, and a couple of them are closer to 100,000 monthly listeners. And, and that's like completely digital brands. We're not, you know, out in the road, um, you know, busting our backs. Like, I mean, I was sleeping in the back of a Prius, you know, making it to, to different um, different shows, which is really romantic, you know, and it's, it's really, you know, fun to say that you did that back then. But, you know, the fact that we were able to actually make money through this is, is really exciting. So that's kind of, um, you know, where, where we sat, um, with everything. So that's, a uh, that's, uh, pretty much the, the nut, the nut of it. That's awesome, Taylor. I, I think it's super cool. I'm already learning so much about microsync, just listening to you guys already. Um, and it's a good time to remind our room that, um, we're never endorsing any one company or any one path. Everybody's path is different. So, you know, listen to tonight and anything that we do on any night, um, you know, with the open mind and open hearts of, you know, what works for one might not work for another. But I love that you're creating this uh, kind of opportunity for artists of all various sizes, um, especially to be able to get your stuff um, heard more. So, you know, for example, if you're an artist and that's a priority for you, because it's not a priority for everybody, but I'm already hearing that if you're an artist, it sounds like this could be 
a really cool pathway to get more ears and internationally on your kind of stuff, uh, which is super neat. But Eric, do you want to dive into that or do you want to kind of lead with that question? Um, I was, yeah, let me, let me just jump in real quick. That was really awesome. I, um, well, let me ask this cause we, we, before we start, I want to kind of solidify the definition of what this is because a lot of people have, have taken that term micro sync and tossed it around. And I try to give some kind of high level description at the start, but from the people who are doing it, if someone comes up to you and says, Hey, I hear you. You work or live in microsync. Um, can you share what that is? Can I can I kick that to you first? Kick because um, you do a lot with the artists in your community. So if somebody's asking, like, yo, how how do you how do you get your stuff either on YouTube or how's this music happening? What is microsync? Is there a standard definition, or how do you explain it? So there is actually a standard definition of what microsync is. So pretty much microsync, and this is like I say, what I explain uh, a lot to my students are more micro opportunities such as YouTube influencers, social media, um, you know, pre pretty much anything that's not more commercially based. And those opportunities are micro be also because they actually pay less than a larger sync opportunity. So usually a lot of my students will say, well, how do I go about putting, you know, going to companies or YouTube influencers to get my content placed in uh, their, their content as well, musically. And the, West, the best West, the best way I say to go about it is one, start building the relationships, of course. It's kind of the same formula. And introduce yourself talk to them. You know, a lot of them, a lot of my students I work with now, a lot of them I tell like, hey, get a little library of your music together, reach out to these imp uh, YouTube influencers or influencers in general and say, hey, I know you have a, co you know, you have trouble getting music clear. I understand that if it's not clear, YouTube will ding you. Once you ding three times, then you pretty much got to fight to get your account back because they will deactivate your account every time after three uh, copyright hits that you can't prove that you have permission to use the content, you know, the music in your videos. So it's easier to go directly to us as the music creators to say, hey, I want to work with you because I know more than likely you own, you know, your masters, you own everything, you own the music. And they're more willing to pay you out, you know, fast, $500, $50, well, whatever they may have readily available in their budget. I've actually done this with um, James Charles quite a bit. I've done it in the past was I went to him. He said, hey, I love your music. Let's figure something out. I said, hey, OK, how many videos do you think you make on average a month, a week, whatever? We came to a negotiation and he started paying me out on a retainer for X amount of music that he can use pretty much throughout um, a month of content. And then we would review right afterwards. So that's how I approach it and explain it to, you know, my students and people that ask me what is micro sync and how do you get into it? That is awesome kick. And you, there's a question that I'm going to come back to because I do definitely want to talk about agencies versus direct deals. So I'm going to put a, a, a clip in that because that's really, really interesting. Does anyone else want to um, um, just either add to the definition or explain, to, or say how they enhance on how they explain it? I would say, you know, Perfect. just oh, go ahead, Money Cat. No, you're good. You're good. No, I was just gonna say, um, you know, in a very simple way, you know, I just literally say what it does. Like, it's 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 the engine, it's the machine, it's the it's the outlet you were looking for to get that that global imprint for your music. Um, and and one benefit that I would say that MicroSync has versus a traditional sync is that um, for anybody in the room who's who's joined the, the listening sessions on Saturday, um, Eric Duraj and Steph, as well as others, do a phenomenal job of breaking down, you know, music structure and melody and pitch and everything that has to do with uh, getting your song sonically correct for a brand. 
the good thing, the one thing with MicroSync is that a lot of times they're not brands at all and they're not nearly as picky or particular. And in some cases, you don't even need the clean version. So you'll find things getting synced uh, in the MicroSync world that are not, tr you know, written as a traditional, you know, jingle or, you know, trailer music or something like that. So it just opens up a whole wide world and you get, you know, every kind of person who is watching a YouTube video, maybe it's about cars and they came to see about cars, but now they're hearing your song and they didn't expect to hear your song, but now they're there. And it's just a way of like bringing them in because the other thing with micro syncs is the, is the music they play tends to be longer than it would if it was in a TV show or film. So you're, they might hear the whole song play throughout and, and it's easy for them to, to sh Shazam it or sound hound you and, and find you and follow you. That is awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, Money Cat, what were you going to say? Oh, yeah. We were just going to say that, you know, another thing that the, when you're thinking about micro syncs is um, we've had luck with like, say it's say it is a corporate client. Right. But it's something little that they don't have a big budget for. Like we'll have like something used in like a Snapchat ad. And it's like you get like one hundred thirty-five dollars, but shit, man, I'll take one hundred thirty-five dollars. It's and like th internal. There will be like internal. Yeah, internal stuff. videos that they'll use, or even like wedding videos. We've had songs used in wedding videos. Oh, so there's this guy that we love. His name's Matt Johnson, and he does video tutorials. I guess. Yeah. Uh, he's like a video, a filmmaker, and we came across our own song on his channel. <laughs> yeah, we, we 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 like subscribed to him and yeah. watched. And we were like, wait a sec. And then we went and we looked in our dashboard, and it was, and it was there. He um he used our song, and and I will say that like if you get on a a YouTuber's channel, those listeners are, you know, we've all got our channels that we like. Yeah, it's so personal to you. You're invested and you watch their videos. And if there's a song, you're gonna pay closer attention than if you were gonna pay, you know. If there was just a song passively in the background, you're right. Colin. So that like might lead to like actual stuff. actual fans. Yeah. So yeah. So it's 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 a lot of different things. But I would think of a micro sync is anytime they synchronize your music to video, mm -hmm. and they the budget is smaller. And I may be it's wrong. A little more indie. There may that's be a little be more. Like, well, there mm -hmm. may be like a better definition than we know. But that's just our side of it. Is like, yeah. you know, whereas somebody might have fifty seven thousand dollars to pay for this or whatever, these smaller ones do add up to nice chunks and there's less stress and it's just a little thing that you don't even know it's like passive income and the 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 different cl click licensing and is, is the way i think of the micro syncs a lot of companies because we work more through agencies and i think that's the question you're going to get to so maybe i'll wait on that but um yeah so basically that there's a bunch of i was just going to say that a micro sync could be a bunch of different things but i would define it as something that is you know a smaller fee for hitting less ears maybe but it's that the people have less of a budget and you still want to be able to get them music because they need music too now with everybody uh being pretty licensed crazy on on youtube and in, and in commercials and yeah stuff. this this is amazing it's really insightful um money cat while we're still on you you mentioned that okay you go you go to a youtuber that you actually liked and then surprised to find your music there do you know how they got your music? Can you walk us through where specifically they got it from and how they found you? Yeah. So our our catalog is listed on Marmoset's website, and they do um, they have two sides of their business. So, where they... so let me let's interject this for our audience. So because we did yeah. we we talked about this the last time you were on here. Marmoset is a sync agency who deals primarily with larger ads, right? Um, yep. but, yeah. But they've uh, apparently they, they're in the micro sync space too. And so, okay, yeah. continue. I just wanted to put to, yeah. to set no, that that's for good. my audience. Yeah, so you could you could go and check out our music, whether honestly, whether we've released it or not. Um, all of our songs are up on their website for anybody to go and check out. And if you've, they have like podcast licenses, they have YouTube specific licenses that are like, I don't know, 99 bucks. I'm looking at a bunch. Of, I'm look. I have my dashboard open right now and I see like $45, $45. And that's split between where that's like 45 for me, 45 for call it. And then whatever their cut is. So like little. Just so they may be paying 150 yeah. or maybe 300 so bucks or something. With that, Matt Johnson, um, we went into our dashboard and we were able to find it. Cause when we heard our song, we like went and looked for that song and like what has used that song. And we saw that he did in fact, he came to Marmoset's website and he just click license, you know? And oddly, we have experience on the other side of it because um, 
when we are we we're actually from Ohio too. Okay, we're from Youngstown, Ohio, up up in the northeast corner, and then Ooh, we moved out to Los Angeles. Yeah, the, dude, we love Ohio, man, and we love Cincinnati. I used to play down there all the time, but um, like Ohio has some great music. Shout out to Ohio, but um, oh, what the hell are they gonna say? I got distracted by the sprite. <laughs> Kate brought me a sprite because she's the sweetest. No, no, I was just gonna say uh, that there's all these different ways of, of of getting your music out there, but the way we do it is is through a, a click. Oh, 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 yeah. So we used to do video production. We still do. So we we have cameras, and when we were coming out to California, we needed to make money. So we really did any client that would let us do anything for them. We did video production, and when you're a video producer, so I can kind of speak to that side too. Most of the clients we're dealing with are like, you know, they're like a lawyer in Youngstown, Ohio, or like, you know, a fireworks company that wants to make a series of YouTube videos. If I try to tell them I'm going to get them this song, it's going to be $10,000. They're going to laugh. In our face. They're going to laugh. They're going to go, screw you. I'll get it somewhere else. So we actually have subscriptions to some of the, some of the sites like um, Sound, what's Stripe. That one? Sound Stripe and Premier Beat or Premium Beat. Mm -hmm. And there's a bunch of these places where I'll go and I'll search out songs, Pond 5. And, you know, and they're, they're 75 bucks or 150 bucks or 300 bucks. And that's something that a client can get behind if it's not their main campaign. And it's a really cool way to get music. So we actually have some experience on the other side of it as being purchasers of click license stuff. And it, Did you say that here. your songs are on those sites or you went, no, oh, you go there to I've get other songs them, as a video yeah, producer? Yeah, so I've gone there to get music. So say someone, I'm doing a commercial for somebody and we don't do as much video as we used to do. But that was like for 10 years, that was like how yeah. I made my money. And then I went and played music for love. Right. You know yeah. what I mean? But so when someone says, you know, we're doing a series of YouTube videos and I'm producing them, they're not going to let me pay 6,000 bucks for a, a thing. But if I type in, you know, into, into one of those sites, if I say, you know, I need a, a classical music for this commercial, I need like a hip hop song for this, I need a country background thing, they'll search by genre. And then you'll click on them. So the the artists that are they're getting their their money still through these through these companies. But like I said, they're they're only going to hit the people in that one market. But still, man, that stuff adds up. Yeah, it really does. It adds up financially and discovery wise. You know. I, I'll add one more thing that I that, that's been on the tip of my tongue, and I was just trying to think of when to say it. Ryan Wines, who runs, who owns Marmoset, he's like the 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 guy who started yeah, it. He's, he's mm -hmm. brilliant. But we were on a panel with him one time in Hawaii at this music conference. And he said the coolest thing. He said, you know, back in the day, the pie was just way less slices, right? So if you got a commercial, you may get $40,000 for that commercial. Now, the pie is humongous. So it's, much bigger. It's, 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 it's infinitely bigger. But every slice is so small. But that's okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because everybody needs video content. Yeah. Amish food markets in Ohio well, have used our, and I'm like, you're an Amish food market, but they got a website, you know what I mean? So they need a song for it, you know? So, go ahead, go ahead Steph, it's just so amazing. Yeah, no, I I, I agree. And I want to get into um, this a little more in depth because we're starting to talk about the sites that you can go through and the Pond Fives and the things like that that used to be used and what's new about the new sites that are kind of replacing these Pond Fives, even though those will be around kind of forever, unfortunately. Um Daraj, I want to kick this one to you because there's a lot of controversy over microsynths. And I would say it more comes because people don't um, have a lot of knowledge about it, which is why I'm super glad we're doing this room in terms of back end royalties or buyouts or, you know, what you're giving up and what it does to the larger kind of sync thing. If we're also, you know, giving really great artists and really great songs to, uh, you know, big brands for very little money. Um, can, can you get into some of the deal stuff with us in terms of, I know you've done this uh, at a couple of different sites, but can you kind of take us through the types of deals that you can do with some of these, you know, micro sync reps sites, especially? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it'd be good to toss it to Taylor afterwards. Cause he's, I think a little bit more verso. Um, and just for context, um, my primary Primarily, my experience with this side of the industry has been through a site called Musicbed. If you actually go to their website now, um, I'm I'm on their featured banner because it, it was, this was kind of good timing, you know, for this talk and just some of the things we've been working out with them because uh, they just picked up my back catalog from the time when I was signed with my independent label uh, or the independent label I was with. Um, they just you know front front loaded all of that on there. Um, so this is a good kind of time to like a, a real case study to kind of see it. But 
Uh, yeah, because, you know, for me, I, I was really drawn to uh, this side and, you know, working with Music Bed in particular because um, they, you know, have a, like, I was still able to retain a lot of my, you know, all of my rights to my songs, um, you know, as far as they don't, you know, like a traditional licensing agency deal, a uh, rep deal, you know, they don't own any of your masters or publishing. Um, you keep that. It's a similar splits that we're used to, like the... 50 50 some 60 40 um some are more exclusive than others they have you know kind of exclusivity around different things um because like with music bay they have the subscription model they have the single song purchase and they also kind of do traditional licensing um and some have different levels of, of exclusivity um primarily with the subscription model they're um, they have a little bit more, um, they're a little bit more protective about, you know, repping your artist brand for the subscription model, um, exclusively for a term. Um, but there are, you know, some of the, the deal points with, um, this, I, I could be wrong with the single song and then also actually the single song might be exclusive as well, but I do know the tr more traditional pitching, um, uh, we have some flexibility there, so it can almost be, you know, like in a non-exclusive, um, traditional pitching way. And so. Uh, I've always appreciated that, you know, it's literally been, you know, a vehicle that's helped me to, you know, leverage um, some consistent revenue to even transition out of my job, which I'm doing this week. Uh, woo -woo, I'm excited for that. Um, so that was one of the things that kind of helped that transition. Now, uh, I will say not every uh, company is kind of created equal. So, um, you know, I've been approached by different companies where, um, you know, some, you know, they do either complete buyout. Some don't even, you know, have you allow you to register your, uh, yourself with a PRO, which I, I highly dis, you know, discourage. Um, but you know, there's just different, you know, uh, just different structures. So you definitely want to, uh, define what success looks like for you. And we always opt for, you know, giving the artist the most and maximum amount of control of their, uh, their music um but i think taylor might also be able to touch into it because he's had more experience with this side than i have and you know we're kind of both on similar on a similar platform let me ask before taylor jumps in well let me ask you taylor can you say if you do your deals through a particular agency or company what company that is and then if you can talk about the types of deals you have with them that would be really informative yeah um so I, I really, I started with Musicbed um, actually through a friend, uh, this guy, Jake Etheridge, that uh, a few years ago, I mean, it was during the prime time. I mean, people were making like $5,000 a month for uh, just basic folk music. I mean, it was just unbelievable um, what um, returns were coming in. I mean, every year it seems like the landscape of, of sync has changed and Musicbed is kind of their agreements have shifted almost every year or every other year. And just like um, uh, Jared was saying is that uh, right now we're in, we're in the, the time where you can go to a place like music bed, which used to be more closely, honestly, to a publishing deal where they would have exclusive access to anything you've written um, ever and not just a project-based agreement, but right now they're in they're in the middle of a project-based agreement. Say Jared had you know just his Dirage stuff up there, he could just give them Dirage and then go off and do you know other projects with somebody else. Um, and I want I want to jump in here real quick, Taylor, because this was something that was a new term for me. When he says project, he's kind of referring to like my alias as Dirage, and I might have another alias, you know, like Sunny O you know, that's, you know, considered a project in music bed language. So I wanted to kind of clarify that. But you, well, and hold one, just, sorry, Taylor, just to keep clarifying this. Daraj, you are an independent artist and Daraj is your brand, but are you signed to them so that anything you put out, Daraj, they get first look at, they get, or everything that so Daraj if is? It, if it's pertaining to the subscription portion, um, anything outside of that, no. So, and, and it doesn't, you know, they don't have any say so as far as I'm releasing anything on DS, you know, DSPs or like there, there's no involvement in that. It's literally if I want to put my music for micro syncing, micro syncs on like a subscription based, you know, kind of cart system, um, I can only have Dirage on their site. I couldn't do the same thing with another micro sync, you know, agency that has like a cart front end cart system, if that makes sense. 
No, that's great. Okay, let's go back, Taylor. So can you continue with, with um, so with Musicbed and the deals that are there now, and is that the, is that the company you work with or do you do multiple companies? Yeah, I mean, it really kind of depends. Uh, th- that typically is the first one we go to. Um, as, as I feel like they're, they're, the way that they curate music, they're so very in tune with, if you, I mean, even if you look at, you know, the Dirage brand on a music bed as the feature banner, like every banner image, they're very in tune with the, sonically how their brand is coming across and also visually how their brand is coming across. So typically you see better results with a place like music bed. Um, I mean, we've, we've done work with, with Marmoset too, and it, it, every one of these, companies um, have a different strong suit. So uh, just to say that, you know, just a blanket statement that music bed does well with everything is just not true. Um, I mean, for instance, we, we had a, a project that I had my personal voice on that was, that's called uh, guest house. And we pitched it to music bed and, and music bed uh, denied it. And honestly, if we would have got, if we would have gotten picked up by them, um, it, it would have done, I would say, arguably it would have done, uh, much worse there than uh, whenever we moved it over to Artlist. Artlist is kind of like my second option, um, as as I don't feel like their standards are as as high um, when it comes to uh, how specific or maybe not standards, maybe like specificity of what they're looking after. Musicbed has a, has a very specific taste, and they curate around that taste. And so, but the, but the the drawbacks to the different agreements. Um, it can't really be seen for a lot of people that are listening right now. I feel like what's really useful to know about each of these different licensing houses and how they have their deals arranged is that Artlist will take, it's, it's a 70-30 split in, in company favor. So Artlist takes 70%. And that sounds super scary, but then you look at the performance on the back end on what they make you. And that's really what you should be looking at. You should be talking to the artist on these platforms and kind of having these transparent conversations and saying like, hey, you know, how are they monetizing? How are they utilizing your copyrights? And how much value are you getting for that? Um, and, and that way you can kind of bolster your confidence and, and, and make sure that you're in the right place with your type of music. Um, because when you look at Musicbed, you see, you know, 50-50 or 60-40, and they have to have these consistent yeah, none of these contracts that you enter into with these micro licensing companies are ever really um, you can't negotiate with them because they have to have a boilerplate percentage because whenever they pay out for their subscription base, for instance, they have to pay out to, I mean, 100, 200, whatever, 300, however many artists that they have in their catalog. And it has to be consistent because they split the pot. Um, and that's that's a hard conversation to have with artists whenever they're first getting into micro licensing, because when you go to a boutique house in, in L.A. or New York or wherever, uh, Cincinnati, even potentially, um, it, it's it, it becomes this whole, well, I want to negotiate. I want to get a very artist favored deal and I want to get the best deal I can. And there becomes this ego at play, um, which which really stifles your opportunity with these companies if you don't know beforehand that they don't move for anybody. Um, and, but, but like Jared was saying too, the great thing that music bed has now entered into is giving you the opportunity to expand and, and link up with boutique licensing houses alongside, you know, places like music bed. And I don't know if Marmoset has moved to this, this as well. I know Artlist has, um, and, uh, I know music vine out of the UK is, has kind of been, you know, here and there. I, I about they've been kind of trying to follow follow I think more music beds model with the way that they split things and the way that they run things still with the single use licenses because Artlist doesn't do that. This um, is, let me jump in real quick, Taylor. This is really insightful, so I appreciate it. Let me. I want to quickly just ask Psychosis and kick one question about their deals, and then I want to get into Discover. I want to transition into talking about Discovery, um, but real quick. Um, psychosis and then kick psychosis. Um, what company are you with? And can you share with, if your deal is the same as what's, if it's the same as what's already been discussed and just say that if it's something different then elaborate on it. Yeah, no problem. Um, I actually primarily work with Artlist, which is what Taylor was just talking about. And, uh, I will 100% agree. Um, every company is different, but m- majority of them, as I was mentioning earlier for me, um, with the, the question is really about if you if you're asking about the money or you're asking about the impact, it is primarily on the back end um, 
of what it can do for you as an artist in terms of growing your monthly, monthly listeners and your actual streams on a DSP and that turning into money that you generate that way. Um, or the mechanicals that may also be generated from that. Uh, but the upfront split is normally, you know, pretty small. Um, but the payouts, uh, I would say that was probably another thing we didn't all specifically talk about. The payout structure is different than what you would get like from your PRO. So some of them like Artlist, for example, they pay you out once a year uh, in December. Some of them pay you out, you know, quarterly or monthly. Um, so you want to be mindful of when you're going to actually get paid. Um, but you also, you know, they're getting better at giving you um, information on like how many streams, what song, where, um, and those type of things you can then turn around and use for your marketing uh, as an artist. If that's, you know, your focus, you, you understand that, oh, this is where people are syncing my music, this country, this platform or whatever. Um, the biggest thing I would say is that you can just get a lot of engagement, which I know we're going to talk about more, but. But I work with primarily with artists. That's great. And I really appreciate that insight. Um, what about you, Kick? Who, who are you with? And is the deal what's already been shared or something different? Actually, it's the same as Psychosis, Artless. Uh, I actually have been with Artless for about five plus years. Our, the reason I stick with Artless is they're very lenient. In, and this is my own personal experience. They're very understanding and lenient with me on a lot of things. Um, kind of to uh, Taylor's point earlier that a lot of these platforms have, they cater to a certain style, genre. They have their own model of what they want their content to be on their platform. Artlist is a little more loose. They're a little, they're way more understanding. Um, again, my own personal experience and I've made, you know, I'm not going to say the exact amount, but I have made a su substantial amount being on Artlist. And it's easy for me to really talk to them, especially because, again, I'm one of the, oh, technically, I'm an OG. You know, that's what some of the other artists, have, when they reach out to me and stuff like that, the collab, they call like, oh, yeah, you're an OG. I remember getting on here, getting on the website. Your face was always with others you know, all over the website because they were still trying to figure things out. Yo, I, I got I got to jump a real quick kick because I was actually yeah. uh, talking to another artist who, you know, is in the micro sync space and sent them the flyer. And he was like, oh, yeah, I know kick. He was all like basically what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I got I, I got to mean, I got to jump in, too, and say, you know, as yeah. soon as I got approached by this, I was like, yo, y'all need kick on this platform because, you know, he's he's definitely one of the coaches gave the alley -oop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> also, kick. Also, kick. After this is over, I'm gonna I'm ask you for uh, about twenty dollars if I can hold something. Appreciate you. <laughs> hey, I can't. Give me a cat. <laughs> kick. I, I think it's safe to say you're micro famous. You know, I think this is uh, a thing now. I'm coining a new phrase for for, for micro things that you're micro. There you go. Some micro famous in a, ma in a major way. <laughs> exactly. But, yeah. But yeah, just to wrap it up, I mean, I, I've been on other platforms. I mean, I've, man, I did Music Bed. Music Bed booted me because I wasn't producing enough for them at, a, at the pace they wanted. Uh, I was on Soundstripe. I actually have a, a more racial issue with Soundstripe because of the way they said, hey, we don't feel like we can service you anymore. And when I was not on there, they actually got rid of pretty much every black composer on their platform at that time. Again, that's that's a different topic. So I actually have a personal issue with Soundstripe, but a lot of the other platforms, I after those two, I kind of just like, you know what? Artlist has been a good friend to me, a good partner. And they're very, again, in my experience, easy to work with. You can give them something. And, you know, I know uh, Daraj, you were saying you've had issues in them trying to push stuff through and I've actually after talking to you a while back I brought that up to them that there are these other musicians these creators that are trying to get on your platform and they are struggling to get stuff approved and they were very transparent with me with saying like they're actually growing to be one of the largest leading licensing platforms in the world and it's faster than they can actually recruit people to help them out primarily because they're based in Israel 
there are laws and labor laws and things like that are totally different than how we operate here in the U.S. and in other countries. So they're doing the best that they can. But I digress. Actually, just to recap what you were saying, Kick, I think this is the perfect time to remind everybody, like kind of what I was saying with the, my earlier somewhat disclaimer, that what I'm hearing from you is, you know, one thing that did not work for Duraj totally worked really well for you. And it's really important. I think we talk about this all the time across all types of sync to build relationships where you can and to know your deals and to know what works best for you. Uh, because what works for psychosis might work for kick, might not work for Duraj, might work for Duraj, you know, obviously. Um, I, I also want to say thank you for being an advocate to your fellow artists, because that's something I want to encourage in this room, especially in our control camp community. Um, the fact that you went back and spoke to those folks at Artlist just, you know, for on behalf of Duraj, you know, maybe not even mentioning his name, but advocating for the community that's trying to help them because the more we educate companies that we work with, the better it gets. And I think a lot of people are afraid to do that kind of education because they think if you speak up uh, and you stick up for other writers or things like that, then you know you could it could be a detriment to you. But I think if you're always polite about it and you know your relationships, it's an amazing thing to do. So yeah, I mean, absolutely. That's how I approach it too. With them, primarily with them or anyone, really, it's like I come in with good intentions to the point that if they do come back in a more negative, non-positive tone that I know I did everything right, that I came respectfully, and hey, I might need to go the other way. But I mean, to be honest, they, they, I always tell people, because people message me all the time, like, you know, I'm, how do you feel about this platform? How do you feel about them, this other place? And I always give them, you know, the same uh, encouragement, words of advice is just like, find what works for you. If people communicate, and respond very well, respond the same way, read the room, take time, don't automatically think because they didn't get back to you right away that they're not interested. These people are just like, you know, people that work really professionally in the sync world. They sometimes don't always have the time to respond right away. So you got to give them time. This is so awesome. I really, one, I appreciate, for everyone on the panel, I appreciate your forthrightness. And I just want to also say, backing up, um, what Steph said, just it was one of the reasons why not just this room, but there's a couple times we do rooms that have to deal with specific te technology companies, and we choose not to have representatives from the company on the stage because one, we don't want it to look like we're doing an endorsement, and two, we you know we don't want to put any company in a position to start pitching themselves or selling themselves. So it was one of the reasons why we were very particular about about bringing artists on the stage. The artists can talk about their experience on the company and we, with the companies, and we think a much better value for our audience to have the artists objectively talk about their experience. So all that was very intentional, and I'm, I really appreciate hey, y'all hey, doing that. Hey, Eric, real quick, I, I guess that means, so I did ask Artlist if they'd be actually willing to join Clubhouse to have a, have a conversation about how their platform works so people could have a better understanding. And I did bring you all up. So that's something you're interested in. I could definitely make that happen. Oh, well, yeah. Well, let's talk offline about that. We, we appreciate that. We like we do like this with the, the artist focus, but that's definitely something to talk about. Um, let, let's let shift into a reset. I think the artist is going to take over. I, I, think, uh, I think what might be more entertaining is if we bring all the micro sync companies and just do like in the in the Batman movie where Joker he just breaks a pool stick and throws it in the middle and just kind of <laughs> <white hands. laughs> let him do it out. <laughs> Whoever oh, comes man. out alive is the winner. That's the best we thing coming. We don't need another. We don't need another uh, uh, distro kid situation. We don't need that. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. <laughs> I, I I assume it's a uh, is appropriate, but let me let me do this quick reset because I man, this is a a really uh, rich conversation. I, I like that we're we're talking about it because one. Um, I think it's just an unfamiliar space. Like, you know, it was something I got introduced to kind of this side of things back in maybe 2018 or so when I met Music Bed. They were the first company. And then fast forwarding now, um, working with them, but just understanding just that there's way more companies out there like this. And this is just a, a, a you know, just a just a good educational piece. I'm always good. Like, I'm always wanting 
um, artists just to know their position and their the options that they have, whether they choose to or not choose to. But anyway, let me get into this reset real quick. So for those who are just joining us, um, you know, welcome. We are Control Camp. Uh, here we are a community of um, independent artists, composers, uh, licensed agents, publishers, you know, you name it. We just created this community to help uh, bridge the gap for those looking to get their music into this space, which we call sync licensing. Um, and so we have these rooms every Wednesday uh, at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we like to bring in special guests and just have, um, you know, just an engaged conversation to understand uh, what it is that um, their, uh, their roles in sync are, you know, how they navigate through the space, how we might be able to uh, serve them and also just, you know, what it takes to succeed um, in this space. And so uh, we have a full panel now and we just have, you know, some really enlightening conversation and uh, stick around because in the second half, uh, we went a little over early on. So I think we're going to continue the Q&A for a little bit, but um and in a, a short time we're going to bring everybody or you know allow the audience to come on stage and ask your questions um so definitely you know if you have any questions pertaining to the topic at hand uh stick around because we're going to open hand raising and, you, and we'll be pulling people up so you can ask um our guests you know just whatever questions you might have so be writing them down and, and keep them in mind um, we also want to say if you've been just appreciating this conversation and this sounds like something that would be um, helpful for any artists uh, that you might know or composers, producers, uh, go ahead and ping them into the room. Um, you know, we created this space to, you know, just really educate the community on how to, you know, grow and thrive in this space. And so uh, ping somebody in. Also, we have resources available on uh, controlcamp.com. Uh, so if you uh, swing over to our Sync 101 page, you'll be able to see all of uh, the PDF resources we have, the room replays, um, you'll be able to catch this replay on there as well. Um, and you can uh, sign up and get access to everything um, uh, for a really, really uh, affordable amount over on our Patreon. So go ahead, check that out. And uh, yeah, I, I want to keep this conversation going. Uh, Eric, I'm going to tap back in with you. And uh, if I missed anything, go ahead. No, we're good. I'm actually going to pass it to Steph and then I will continue because she got a question and then I'm going to jump in too. Yeah, you know, Daraj, kind of what to what you were speaking to earlier with, you know, discovery of new platforms and there's a new technology every day. I think this is probably a good time. We don't say it enough that Clubhouse has been amazing. We're really grateful to be on Clubhouse. But, um, you know, I think we're looking to also expand. There's going to be everybody's been hearing murmurings of new audio platforms and things that are happening. So I actually want to take just one second to say to everyone in the room, please sign up for our mailing list. You don't even have to say, I mean, if you want to sign up for Patreon, great. If you, you know, feel like you have the information you need, but I highly encourage everyone to sign up for our mailing list because who knows clubhouse today, maybe Twitter, maybe something else tomorrow, exclusive content for each one of those things. But I'm going to start keep, you know, to keep pushing that one. Awesome. Awesome. Yes. And to get on the, to get on the mailing list, go to controlcamp.com at the very bottom of the page. You can sign up on the mailing list, which is awesome reminder, Steph. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Can we talk about, um, I, since you're talking, can we talk about royalties and backends and some of these deals a little bit more? Can you? Yeah. Kind of into this sort of I thing? Think, yeah. Awesome question because, um, I don't want to mix up the word back end because that's been tossed around in, in the conversation too. But for our audience, most people think back end, they think royalties, they think what's going to show up on the PRO statement. Now, cor and so correct me if I'm wrong, but what we're dealing with with microsyncs, at least my understanding, is we're talking really all front end, all a bunch of front end syncs, which in essence are really micro buyouts in a sense. So you're not getting um uh pro you're not getting royalties every time the youtube video is played is that correct or somebody correct me if i'm wrong anybody can jump I, on that taylor i see I you do, I, yeah so uh the big thing that uh music bed has gotten into recently as in the last year um and art list is actually trying to jump in on this as well but obviously things are a bit slow because they're so inundated, but content ID is like a really, really big thing 
that's going to come to play over the next two to three years for all these companies um, as they begin to roll that out a little bit more. But Content ID is essentially the YouTube version of your PRO royalties on the back end. And that's usually, through MusicBed at least, it's paid out quarterly. Um, like Psychosis was saying, you know, earlier, you know, really getting in tune with the idea of, uh, you know, how each company pays out. Artlist pays out, you know, annually. MusicBed does pay out monthly, but their content ID actually only pays out quarterly. So um, let me just clarify, Taylor. So we're not talking about the typical um, royalties that BMI and ASCAP um, and, um, collect from like radio play or whatnot. We're talking about the advertising money that YouTube sets aside um, for streams and a portion of that is sent to the musicians. That's, is that what you're referring to as content ID? Yeah, yeah. The, the Whatever money that video makes from ad revenue and, and so forth, yeah, it gets distributed to the uh, the owners or the administrators of that copyright, which, you know, if it's MusicBed, then MusicBed will handle that um, collection and pay out to you. Very, very cool. And I just saw a text from Daraj, so you can jump in, Daraj, saying that MusicBed actually refers to these as royalties, even though they're different than the royalties we think of. But in in their lingo, they're referring to them as, as royalties. Is that what you're saying, Daraj? Yeah, I can go into my back end on MusicBed and it'll have a section for royalties. Um, and they also have a, a place where you kind of download your statements. And you in it, it's kind of cool because they do show you kind of just different segments of the industry of where, you know, the revenue is coming from. And then also you kind of get a um, not a super robust, but you'll get a, a kind of an itemized um, spread of just like what was uh what song was used kind of i guess a description of what it was used for how much you you know your percentage that you collected off of it um i think the total and how much your percentage was and so it's they they do a pretty good a good job of just get given like kind of like some basic analytics but um again taylor could probably speak to it even more than i can but yes there is that language that's on their back end no, this is great. It's really, really um, insightful and uh, helpful. Let me ask money, let me bring Money Cat into the conversation because with you guys and Marmot said, this is a really unique thing because you can have one song that you're able to look at and compare within a year how that song did with the big advertisers versus how that song did with the micro syncs and the content ID and however Marmot said, you know, labels, labels that. Are, are you, has, have you been in it long enough with, and has Marmoset been involved in this long enough where you're able to contrast like, okay, when we started, you know, at the end of the year, um, big sinks were a hundred percent of, of the income that we got from Marmoset. And now it's like 50, 50, or is it 70% big sinks, 30% for micro sinks? How is the distribution that when you, when you're looking at, has it been long enough for you to look at that and compare? Yeah. I, I think that just from looking through the dashboard, no, this is a rough estimate because I didn't, we didn't actually do the math on this, but it looks like the micro sinks are always in the back cooking, but the, the more recent dashboard that we're looking at has more of the bigger placements. Um, so I think that we might've gotten more micro sinks at the beginning with them, but also I, they're not actively pitching um the micro sinks they just have the website that people can kind of go and click license you know yeah so it is funny to see and that's i think with like the cost it it's like the song is the song right but you have to take into account what it's going to be used for and who is using it and that's what sets the budget you know, because we'll have one song that's like being used for, I don't know, 30, we'll, we'll get $45 each. And then like that exact same song can be used by like Wendy's and they're not getting it for $35. Yeah. You know what I mean? And sometimes they'll do on the, on the, this is the other end, not the micro sync end, mm -hmm. but just for context. Um, sometimes people will like, like exclusively buy it out for an industry. And I'm assuming that would affect their click license side of it. Yes, but then they have to pay more. A in lot order more. to get that yeah so to get that exclusivity if they say there's no one in this 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 market can use um 
this song because they're buying it for like exclusive national Dentist. ad. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? So that that that's one end of it. But I so I will say I feel like our experience here is to offer like we're 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 artists that are working with a boutique agency that has a microsync side of it. Whereas I feel like most of the other guys on here have a lot more um knowledge about what an actual um what the microsync side of it is. But I, I thought we could add that perspective because they do have that side of it. But I do think that it's a it's a it's a smaller portion of what what they actually sync for us because most of their stuff is like direct to an ad agency they're pitching us you know what i mean right Whereas the stuff that is discovered by someone going to that website is is what we're where we might get the click license money from and a lot of their stuff i know that they did add they did a campaign that actually hit us yeah. that was for reels like i think it was like 79 bucks or 150 bucks or something like that you could get something to use one of their songs on on your reel so if you're your portfolio or something so it was that, that was like directly which to is really individual cool artists. because we do i i do find that um advertiser advertisers not like like ad agencies yeah the agencies. I, the agencies like that's pretty cool if they take your song we found a few of our songs getting used on their agency website showing off the best of the best of their work they pay like 79 bucks or something for to use that song in, in their reel. If they're a big agency, they probably pay more though. Yeah, they may pay more, but it it also made it's still kind of like a micro sync yeah, comparatively true. to what they're doing, um, their normal budgets, you know yeah. what I mean? But th I mean the exposure you can get from from the agency being like, this is the best footage that we have to offer, and we're gonna use it to sell to all of the clients that we have, like that's a great placement. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Hey, you know, this this is um, interesting too, because I think one thing, like I, I like hearing kind of the different nuances in this space, because again, just like in sync, every deal is kind of different. And so I think even in this, you know, what we're calling micro sync, every company that kind of is a front facing micro sync site, you know, in essence, you know, has, you know, different nuances. Um, yeah, cause I, I noticed one thing, um, that I've seen as well, uh, we haven't touched on is there are the smaller kind of micro syncs, um, that happen where, you know, content creators, you know, have access and it's kind of a more affordable alternative, but, um, you know, there, are some of these companies as well will do traditional pitching as well. Cause I've landed, um, you know, like a call of duty mobile placement through music bed. And I know others who have had, you know, kind of the more traditional, bigger, um, more premium licenses. And I, I, I think, I feel like I knew at one point, I can't recall right now, just what that threshold is when it comes to usage, you know, the type of clients that are coming, because, you know, I know music bed is very hands-on with, you know, their customer service and trying to provide, you know, suggestions. Um, and I think they treat different clients differently and try to, you know, negotiate based on maybe size and um, need and all that kind of stuff. But um, I, I think that's a good, you know, a, another perspective to kind of put into the mix um, as far as there are the smaller ones. And then some companies also um, do traditional pitching. And so there's some opportunities there uh, potentially. This is really, really good. We're learning so much from this. And so, again, I appreciate all of you for just sharing um so freely so let's um quickly we're going to cover a couple of, a couple of other small topics and then we'll open it up to uh general questions but one thing i want to talk with them um, with artless or um uh, my mind's for music bed with artless or music bed do you is, can anybody articulate how discovery works with them um is the user typing in metadata terms? Like, do you, do you know how it works? And then what are you doing as an artist to ensure that you get discovered more easily? Do you have that, you know, Dirage, Kick, Psychosis, Taylor? Um, kick, I so, see you up. Go, go for it. So from my end, the you know, the, the, a lot of them pretty much use the same kind of method. So it's, you know, keywords. Um, they do like different categories of like, you know, what's the mood they'll add, you know, they have like, what's the mood of your video, the content you're creating, um, uh, you know, kick, family. Kick, kick, let me just ask when you add your songs, are you putting that metadata in it at the time that you submit, that you upload the song to the site or is artless doing it? So they actually do that. 
they do that. But the way they do it is they do it based off of the vibe of what they potentially feel like is the feel of where it could be placed. So that's what I'm pretty much articulating is I research based on them doing that, what kind of music do they categorize under family friendly or empowerment music? And then I compose music that has that same energy, feel, kind of vibrancy um, that kind of, again, mirrors it, knowing that they're going to end up eventually adding that information on their platform uh, oh, own metadata. I like that kick. So you actually approach the site as a user and figure out what type of stuff is coming up based on certain terms. And then you reverse engineer that to make that kind of music that you know, so that you know your music will show up in that search. Correct. Because another thing a lot of people don't know too that are outside of the this realm is that these they don't always, you, they have to approve, it is curated. So the, usually they have to approve the con, the music you create to even be published on their platform. Because a lot of times they'll say, eh, this is cool, but it's not what we feel like our users, our members want. So they'll literally, a lot of them will have rejected. You know, uh, Soundstripe is actually really good for this because you literally go on there, they make you create now more so than ever, like your own key terms and things like that. But that does not guarantee that they will actually take your keywords, your metadata, um, as you upload it to their platform and publish it as that. They'll be like, this is actually more ambient versus electronic. They switch it up because they know their member base. They know who's downloading what because they gather their own data and information. That's what makes them so powerful in the sync world is because they have data. They're collecting data, not just from us, the creators, but also the, uh, the subscribers, the members themselves. Because when you subscribe and pay their membership, they ask you all for all kind of information. And when you're downloading, you know, they know where you're downloading from. They know where you're down, where it's more than likely going to go to. For instance, Nike's on a lot of these platforms. And Nike, you know, they have they actually register because they legally actually have to register their work emails um, when anytime they use a card or whatever to pay for a subscription. So they're like, oh, it's Nike. So they also do like, um, you know, how we're on our we're on Instagram and we're browsing, uh, you know, just through the, through the discovery page or things like that they're collecting data and they're like, oh, you seem to be very more interested in this line of things. These platforms are doing the same exact thing without us even realizing. That is crazy and and interesting to know. Um, Taylor, Diraj, is Musicbed similar? Does Musicbed do the the metadata themselves or are, are you responsible for doing your own? Uh, yeah, it, it, it really is a combination. Um, they, they extract a lot of that data off like the keywords of kind of your lyrical themes. Whenever you have an info sheet like to fill out to, you know, ingest, you know, making sure that they have all the writer's information, their contact information, so they have all their deals in place. One of their fields is a, a lyrical theme, which they extract out of there to, to see what the most important important concept is um, f for your approach to the record. They take that and use that to inform the way that they um, import it into the uh, website itself. But, you know, like Kick was saying, they know best. So at the end of the day, I mean, you really have very little control, thankfully, <laughs> on what uh it, it actually ends up being tagged as um so i mean i love that point of going in and educating yourself first and foremost and not just kind of being like all right well i'm just going to create this project because this is what i feel it's like you know set yourself up for success and and look at these sites and see what's you know they're featuring they're most proud of who's most consistently releasing some stuff like tracking the kind of the success the success um record 
um, and see who has the most stuff like uploaded to the site. That also gives you a good sense of like how, how it, like uh, encouraged they are to give them more material. And if they have more material, that usually means that that project's doing well, not all the time, but majority of the time, that's a good indication of, oh, they have enough money to keep making stuff. <laughs> so This is why I love it. these discussions because they take us to places that we didn't plan to go. But what's so cool about this both of what you're sharing, Taylor, and what Kick shared is, you know, it's it's no different from the sense of traditional license than w- what we've been talking about here. We've been talking about if you want to be on a you know major advertising or if you want to be in television, then you have to study what's getting licensed there. And from the way we've been talking up till now, it would almost seem like, oh, here's an opportunity to just kind of take the music I have put it out there and, you know, a bunch of YouTubers are going to find it and I got money coming in and you guys are saying, no, it's exactly the same. You still got to know what the client is actually using, what's actually working in the marketplace. You still got to study it and then you got to, you know, see if your songs fit that or fit in that or if not create stuff like that. So in that sense, it's no different, which is really, really interesting. Something I want to mention too that's really that it's actually been very beneficial for me and um, other composers and song creators that I know is that think of think of like you know these platforms as your your uh, accelerator so to speak and they give you discovery in a way that has been extremely amazing so my example I had I, Artless have my music on there. It does really well. Um, it was so good that DJI reached out on the side and said, hey, we recognize that we're paying a subscription and we're downloading your music, but we actually feel a little more comfortable because we really like your content and we actually did our own due diligence on who you are and what you do. We want to work with you directly. Then they came to me again and said, we would love to work with you to create library music for our mobile apps. So now my music, and has been for the past four years, is published on DJI's app for their drones and their gimbals and so forth. So it's I took that as like, wow, I just got a record label deal. <laughs> like, But without you know getting screwed pretty much because they don't take a percentage of anything. They'd pay you flat out. And I'm something that I would have probably got pennies for you know being on art list or any other platform i got fifty thousand dollars flat out like hey give us 30 tracks here's 50 grand you own everything just allow us to use it through our platforms for the next two years and then we'll come back again and pay you out again and then we'll come back again and pay you out again so i just had to mention that that it is an extreme these are extremely wonderful and powerful platforms but you have to set yourself up for true success don't just be lazy and upload like, oh, I'm going to upload stuff. Take your time to create your content and then put it out there. I want to uh, jump, jump in. Oh, on go ahead. Oh, this. Um, go ahead. First of all, I'm going to update my bio and put my cash up in it for you, Kick. Um, but secondly, I, I want to say <laughs> that another way um, to your question, Eric, about the discovery, um, where, where Artlist and many of these platforms do that's really helpful is in their own marketing and own branding or advertising uh, to their customer base, which the customers in this case are usually independent filmmakers or YouTubers or, as Kick said, brands. And they, they're trying to, sometimes they're, they're trying to just find something on the budget, but sometimes they're on here just trying to find something different because it's, it wouldn't normally be on those other platforms or maybe they're just looking you know, to discover someone. But um, well, my Instagram, for example, uh, Artlist used an example of a short f- film slash trailer where they use my music, and then they also are like showing the filmmakers how you know their service can help them develop you know really cool scenes and shots. So uh, if they if they take a liking to your music and 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 your brand and you as an artist, they'll turn around and use you in their own promo campaigns to also help put you out there. I just want to say too that all these guys, I think what we're all talking about too is if you have a relationship with these companies, you can ask them. We do stuff with position 
as well. And we'll we'll say like, hey, like, what are people looking for? Like, what are the themes? Like, like, like Taylor was talking about. Like, and they may say, oh, actually, we have all this data. People are looking yeah, for individuality, data. and or they're looking for non romantic love, or they're looking for you know empowerment, and or even musical things, motifs. Yeah, musical like bands that get yeah. asked like like we get oh, asked all the time for, for this band. So yeah. then you can use that data. And what we usually do is we'll go, oh crap, we had a like a like a world beat song that we didn't think anyone would want, you know what I mean? Because it was like pretty, it was, you know, it was like a like a mumba exactly. reggaeton song. And they're like, oh no, people are always typing in mumba ton. And we're like, shit, okay, okay well, sure, here's our mumba ton <laughs> song. So yeah, so if you have those relationships, you can kind of, you can ask them, you know, and then maybe, maybe they'll tell you, or maybe they have it published, or if they give you, they may have all that data and maybe you can tap into that, like these yeah. guys are all saying, to make, set yourself up for success. So, you know, even if it's just not even just for sync, but what's what is the world doing? What is the you know, they have their finger on the pulse through all that data? That is yeah. I, I would I would to piggyback on that um, to say that you know I would like to think like Steph was saying earlier, like being an advocate for your industry and having people that are in your industry uh, be able to reach out to them. Anybody that's on these rosters, these catalogs. I mean, I'm obviously I don't want an open door for everybody and just you know, go off and, and just ask any question. But if you're thoughtful and, and you reach out to these people and just kind of have a, a heart to heart conversation and be like, Hey man, would you mind if I, if I call you and ask you a couple questions on, you know, what this, what this looks like? Um, I mean, those are resources outside of this panel too. It's, you, you know, you can go to music bed, you can go to art list and reach out to some of these artists and, you know, just ask them, are they happy? Cause people are going to be you know, very, they're going to be, they're going to champion their, their, uh, their platform if, if they're doing well and they're going to, you know, talk shit if like, if they're not doing well. So like that gives you a good indication of like, if their music is doing well, then use that as a, as a guiding light to be able to be like, well, all right, I need to create something that's like in this world because it does well, or I don't need to touch that at all because it's not doing well at all at that platform or, or whatever the case is. I mean, try to you know reach out to those that are in your community to help inform the decisions me, you make can i jump in real quick taylor because i think this is a, a good um like just case in point like actually my introduction to taylor was through that like i was doing research and just kind of going through music beds roster and came across uh his band uh, him and his partner ren um, and they have a, a, a duo called Model Citizen. And I would, one, I was just a fan of the music. And so I just hit them up on IG. Um, and that kind of got the combo started. And Taylor has been like, you know, just a, a huge resource for me. Just not even just with music, even some real estate stuff. But that's another conversation. Um, but he's been just a really big help and a big advocate. And he's helped me kind of walk through some of this stuff. And it's, you know, grown into a good collaboration. And even, you know, him. Um, introducing me to his other partner, Ren, and we've collaborated on music and he, like Ren and I have, you know, a placement that we've gotten together. So like you just, I, I think it advocates one, you know, what Steph always says as well, like knowing how to collaborate and just be a human when you're connecting with people. Um, Cause I've done that, you know, with other artists as well, with other different platforms, just to know like, how do you like it there? Like, what does the deals kind of look like in a very respectful and, you know, patient way, you know, and giving the out, like, you know, you don't have to, you know, have to share anything with me, but, you know, I'm just asking and, you know, I appreciate it, but thank you for your time kind of deal. But uh, yeah, so I just had to throw that in there because Taylor has been like a, a huge advocate for me in this, in this space. So I, I appreciate him. That's amazing. I think it's really important to also remind people, like it's really important to talk to your peers and things like that. Be mindful that some people have NDAs regarding certain things and not everybody can share everything all the time. It doesn't mean they don't want to share with you, but you basically form a little union when you do that. <clears throat> and when we do our deals, I mean, we had to adjust something for a major corporation that we were just dealing with. And I sent our new potential deal that our lawyer sent over to Eric to say, hey, as an artist, how do you feel about this? Can you check this language out? Because I kind of don't love what he did, you know, admit am I being too sensitive? So whenever you can, I think it's super important. I think it's also really important for everybody to know that, um, you know, kick what you said before about, uh, I think it was Soundstripe struck a chord of me. And I have like an email open to you because I want to hear more about that thing because bad news will travel fast about a company. So listen to the community when they speak, you know? So, you know, those things are real. If you hear, and I, I've said this before, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, 
it's probably a duck. Meaning if something about the deal doesn't feel right to you and it stinks, ask your peers and get advice and always speak to a lawyer when you have the opportunity to do so. Such good advice. Such good advice. Okay. Um, two things. One, I'm going to do, I'm just going to do a quick 15 second reset and we hand raising is up. So if you have a question, go ahead and put your hands up. Um, but real quick, we are control camp. We meet here every Wednesday to discuss issues around sync. And today we're having a great discussion about micro syncs, about the, about the sync placements that happen with YouTubers and podcasters and wedding videographers. And we have uh, some great panelists, our own Daraj, Psychosis, Kickly, Money Cat, Taylor are all here sharing their experiences as artists. And um, they've been incredibly insightful. So hand raising is up. I'm going to, and with all questions, um, only ask the question, with, we have like 30 minutes. We're only taking questions around micro sync specifically. Um, so if you raised your hand and it wasn't that, then please put your hand down. And, uh, and instead of bringing up our our guests like we normally do, or um, our panelists, I'm only going to ask, like I see our regulars here, Jaden and Andy, and um, I see John and Steven. If you feel like you uh, want to contribute to the micro sync discussion, then put your hand up. We're not going to pull up pull up people if you if you know you're one of our regulars and you uh you feel like you contribute to the space and you want to be available to answer questions and pull you put your hand up and we'll pull you up um okay so let's start again oh uh you guys have been regulars but you know um you should know the rules or how we do things here we're going to do one question uh we're going to have uh once you ask that question then um we're going to put you back in the audience so that uh, we can can answer your question. But so the one question, no follow up, don't no big setup. Please, let's go right to the to the question. You can start with my question is, and we're going to try to get as many questions in this thirty minutes as we can. So with that, we'll start with Elaine. Hey, love this panel. Um, my question is. Um, I, I just looked on artlist.io and it said that it's non-exclusive. Um, I've been trying to figure out whether to take my songs exclusively somewhere. And I'm just wondering um, if you've got your songs up on Artlist and does, that means you can't send them, you can't be like repped, they can't be repped by an, ex, an exclusive agency as well. Is that right? I, I can jump in let's kick you you know artless better than i do if you want to just jump in yeah so to, to clarify you're asking pretty much you know if you're mu can you put your music elsewhere other than artless correct? um more like i know i can put it elsewhere but um i guess maybe steph also can speak to it um like can i I, can I sign it to an exclusive agent or library or is that, am I, is that a stupid uh, question? <laughs> I see. Okay. So mm, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that because it causes a ripple effect on artless one, because say you do that, have that exclusive exclusivity somewhere else, but you still have this content on their platform. Those content creators that use that content get dinged. And then when they get dinged for their content on whether social media, tw uh, Twitter, YouTube primarily, then they come yelling and screaming at the platform. And then the platform comes to you and says, hey, what's the deal here? Because those platforms have gotten really good at doing their due diligence. They scan your music to see if it's anywhere else or to see if it could be a potential conflict to them if one of their members uh, is to use that in their content. Great answer. Uh, yeah, and I, I would follow up with that with saying that you can bring them over to like a boutique licensing house. And technically, Artlist doesn't operate in the commercial TV film space. Um, even though it doesn't say, there's this gray area in the contract, and you're only going to know this if you know how the companies operate. And Artlist... Um, would be primarily exclusive in the micro world. They're trying to get in and they've introduced this aspect um, uh, uh, over the last year or two. But um, if you go to a boutique licensing house right now and they're open to having that 
relationship. Not not every boutique licensing house is open to having that relationship with a micro company. Um, but if you uh, you know move forward with that boutique licensing house, it's it it at this point they're pretty much exclusive um, with your stuff in the TV, film, commercial world. Um, while Artlist will maintain their micro licensing world, as long as they don't cross over and they're like a multi faceted platform like Marmoset or Musicbed, et cetera. Awesome. Awesome answers. Great. Um, Motor Girl, we got your next. Hey, you guys. Thank you so much, Eric Duraj and staff for this like consistently excellent room. <laughs> and I just want to say hello to Psych- Psychosis and Kick and Money Cat. So great to see you. I see you down there, Jaden. Great to see you. Um, and so nice to meet you, Taylor. So my question is, um, how much of your business um, or percentage of income is MicroSync? And I know, Kick, it sounds like you, you do a lot of it. Money Cat, you fill in the gaps a bit. Diraj, you do a lot. What what does that look like for you guys? Um, let me just filter it because um, we want to have like no more than two responses. Sure. So um, let's say uh, Kick and Taylor, unless you want two others, Kristen. No, that's totally fine. Whatever you think. All right, cool. Kick and Taylor, can you take that, please? Yeah, so for me, uh, MicroSync, so my my income for music is pretty much 80%. And MicroSync, uh, MicroSync is about pretty much 50% of that. Um, like I said, it's been that way for quite a while. I actually, you know, larger opportunities, they pay out large, but MicroSync literally happens for me every single day versus the larger projects that are more campaign style where they pay you out like, hey, here's your upfront payment. And then, you know, you get your publishing and stuff, royalties on the back end. That answers the question. Awesome. Awesome. Taylor? Yeah, I, I, I the back end royalties is kind of where it throws things off because if you have a large upfront fee and you see that for the next two or three years, it could, you know, sway the balance of what you see, um, just because of how much money can can compound over time. But I would say uh, probably about sixty forty. Um, micro sync 60. And then if you consider anything over a thousand dollars, uh, macro, which is what music bed considers, um, then it would be more maybe 60, 40 in, in the macro sync. Um, so it really just kind of depends on the definition of what macro and micro are. Nice. That's probably a fair line with thousand dollars. I kind of, I haven't heard that before, but that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, cool. All right. Dream tonic got you up next. Thanks so much for hosting this room. The world of MicroSync has been quite elusive, so I appreciate bringing some clarity. So to kind of recap, it seems as though there's two paths to MicroSync. Path one is, you know, kind of getting in with these subscription services like Artlist and MusicBed. And path two is kind of creating these relationships directly with the YouTube and content creators and all that. So my question is, um, what percentage of your work and your revenue come from, you know, path one, which is through the subscription services versus path two, developing these direct relationships? And do you have any kind of tips on how to create those relationships to, to kind of figure out who needs what in that YouTube and content creation world? How do you go about finding out what is needed? That's Thank a you. that is a great great uh, question. I'm going to do, pass that to Kick since you did talk about direct um, before, and if one more other person wants to jump in, uh, who does direct, then fine. But Kick, I'm going to challenge you to so that we can keep the questions moving. She asked a lot, but if you can still try to keep it within two minutes, that would be helpful. Yeah. Um, due diligence. That's that's what I tell people. Due diligence first and foremost. Market research. People just try to. A lot of folks try to get into this realm by just jumping into it without actually taking time to understand how does this market work. You actually being in this room is you doing market research and understanding how this market operates. So, I mean, that's pretty much as much as I would say on that piece for now. But building the relationships, too, once you do your research, then you pretty much know where you should go and who you should work with. 
Did you do? Did you say the percentage in terms of how much of your is direct placement versus working through Artlist? Forty percent for me out of eighty is by direct relationships. That's awesome, and that's pretty. That's amazing. Can I jump in on that just real quick? What I was gonna say is, um, one thing that hasn't been said. We kicking everyone else has done a great job talking about building relationships. Probably one of in MicroSync for me, the most relationships outside of the platform itself is the fans that interact with it. Um, YouTube in particular, um, you get people tagging you or coming and commenting on your original song or your original video after they saw it in another placement from the sync. Um, so a big part, exactly. of it for, big part of it for me is replying to their comments, liking their comments, talking to them because of a certain percentage of them, not only do they become fans of you, but they also are probably content creators themselves. And they'll reach out and say, hey, that song I saw on so-and-so's, how can I get it in my video? And then you have a relationship with them and then you could you know, either refer them back to the platform that, that they you know, originally got it from, or you can make a direct deal with them from that point. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just say one quick thing. I, I second what Psychos is talking about because I found out about certain placements because fans were commenting on YouTube videos. There was this guy, I, I, I've never heard of him. He's called like Dr. Disrespect or Disrespect or something like that. He's got like 3 million followers or something like that. And he used one of our Sonny Yo songs. And I had no clue, but it was all through like music bed. Um, and I did the same thing, just comment on it. And I'll actually, sometimes I'll ask you know, the, uh, the fans like, hey, where did you see this? You know what I mean? And they'll kind of direct me and help me, uh, you know, navigate it. And some people actually sent me videos of the actual placement. So it's powerful. That is great. All right, Jared, we got you up next. Greetings, everyone. Uh, kick, I, I sent you a DM about the distro kid thing. Uh, if you can check that. <laughs> but um, I was asking. Uh, I know there's a, a, a variety of uh, micro music things that you guys were talking about that's out there. Um, so, like, when do you just post your music when you sign up as a membership, or do like they send you like any briefs? Like, how does that work? Anybody want to take that posting music versus briefs? So. Um, a lot of, you know, what, what Daraj was just hitting to is, you know, one of the one of the downsides of the micro sync is that you don't normally know where it's going to go if the person has come on from a subscription service. And the way Artlist worked and the reason why I before I even knew what it was when I read their business plan, I realized, like, oh, this would be a great idea is because it works similar than, as some DSPs where people just pay one flat fee and then they can go listen or download anything. So I was like, I'm gonna cast a real wide net. So you don't always know where it's going. So you don't, you're not necessarily um, working with Brees as you would in a traditional sync situation. And you might have to backtrack, like like DeRoger was saying, and find out after the fact where it's been placed, where it's been used. Great, great. Um, Brandon, got you next. How's it going? Hey guys, uh, everybody, it's going good. Um, my question is, and I may have I may have jumped in a little late, so I might have missed. Um, uh, guys, maybe talking about podcast. I just kind of wanted to know, um, uh, I guess more specifically about um, music for podcasts, because I I actually have people request my music for podcasts sometimes, and they are sometimes they sort of um, growl at possibly having to pay back end. Um, or royalties for streaming if they're streaming on using it uh, it's on dsp and or streaming and things like that um so i just wanted to know if that was something that was touched on earlier um after after micro seed companies that that um are um have music specifically for podcast or is that something that anybody's done with where you're working with clients directly um, good, yeah good question we know we actually haven't talked about that we um so is anybody through either Artlist or Music Better, any of the services pitching to, have you got any placements with podcasts or from direct placements? Anybody want to talk about that? Um, we have gotten some podcast placements. I think Marmoset on their website has like a $99 podcast license. And I think that it covers one year of use. Um, so we've gotten a few of those. I don't know off the top of my head what they are, but we have looked them up and they were super fun and exciting to do. So um, I don't think that they actively went out pitching them. I think that the podcast 
creators went to the website, typed it in, whatever they were looking for, and found our song. Oh, I have to ask something. I'm going to jump in. I'm sorry. But to what you were just saying, because, again, I know nothing about this world. Do you get to choose if you want your music used for for this thing or not? Can you decline like regular sync? So like if a podcast about white supremacy or something ridiculous wanted to use my song and I wanted to be like, no, go scratch. Do you get that choice (laughs) or is the company just getting to kind of do these blanket licenses for you? The license that we, or the deal that we signed with Marmoset um, excludes um, like pornography political uh, yeah things that yeah. they have to check with us first so i've never gone through the process of licensing through marmoset but i would imagine because it's all the same deal that we signed right um which would mean that that would stand still there's probably a little box that says is this political that you have to check on your like before you cash yeah. out or whatever before you actually license it and they'd probably would just check with us first but that yeah, come up. <laughs> well, I, and I was going to say, I've had one time where and I think it's the deal was probably similar with music bed in that regard, where um, there was something going on with the Biden campaign and they had they reached out to us before they licensed it to say, are we OK with this? Um, so it, and it wasn't and I don't think that was on the, you know, the traditional micro sync side where they kind of go and just, you know, cart check out a, a song this was more them curating with or them more specifically talking to their camp and negotiating what those terms look like. Um, so yeah, I've, I've seen it in that aspect. Great question and answers. Um, all right, Mark, we got you next. Hey Eric. Hi everybody. Uh, I came in super late and I'm like trying to read what micro sync royalties are right now on the internet to, to understand what it is. But it, my basic question is micro meaning very small. What would you say the, the small range? And I'm sure you said this before, but uh, the payout for a micro sink, what, what general, you know, we're talking less than $500, less than a hundred dollars. Oh, that's a good question, Mark. And no, it's, and it's okay because we, um, well, we didn't talk as much about cash that, that so that's a good question but just for anyone who's coming late to miss it we do post the replay so everything we talked about mm. is going to be um on the replay and you know right. go to controlcamp.com and you can can get that but anybody want to talk what's the range of micro sync um fees sync fees so the the again i always speak in my own personal opinion, uh, experience so the dollar amount it vary. It really depends on who you're working with. I mean, I've had folks who are like YouTube, as an example, who are like college students who are just like, hey, I really want to use your your song in my video for some fun stuff I'm doing. Here's the link so you can see what I'm doing. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's dope. You know, what's your budget like? Like, well, I only got like 20 bucks. <laughs> you're like, 20 bucks? Um, but <laughs> at the same time, you don't want to, you don't want to be, excuse my line, you don't want to be an asshole. You do understand these creators are trying to build their own, you know, they're trying to build their resume. They're trying to just get their work out there too. And it's just understanding when to make the right call. So it varies. It could be as little as, again, for me, $20. The most in micro, it's about about a thousand i mean i wouldn't even say that's micro but you know it's between 20 to a thousand dollars but i mean sometimes again it just depends on who's asking and what they can afford does does that vary for you kick personally um is it helping an, an artist out or is it a certain number of followers makes a lower payment acceptable yeah, it's kind of just, you know, gauging their audience, really. You know, if it's an if it's a big brand, you're like, we know you got it. Come on now. We we know you got something in the bag. Like, pay me my 500 whatever dollars, you know, because if it's for social media, I don't trip, you know, because it's hard to, you can't, it's not like commercial TV broadcast. 
you know, you don't have to do cue sheets. So it's kind of hard to gauge. Heck, to be honest, a lot of them will really just take your music and just put it on their content and just pray that you don't find out. <laughs> but nowadays with Shazam and SoundHow, it's getting a lot harder for them to do that or has gotten a lot harder for them to do that. I see you flashing down there too, Taylor. Yeah, so I, I wanted to... <laughs> I mean, kind of funny situation that happened recently to speak into uh, what this question's about. Uh, Hallmark, for example, I mean, we've we've all probably known that they're, you know, uh, not doing really well for creators. Um, and you can get like a $500 license or a $1,000 license to be on a Christmas movie or whatever. Um, art list, yeah, again, and, 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 and this is the value of looking at the big picture. And, you know, when we're talking about the agreement being 70-30, and then uh, looking at the macro, like of the actual what you can make, um, is a bigger deal. But Hallmark got away with licensing our Christmas song on a Christmas movie for fifty cents. Like that's how crazy. I mean, and you look at Artlist as the bad guy for that potentially, but you look at what they do for you beyond that one little thing and that trip up. There's always going to be pros and cons to every like deal that you get into. And instead of like tripping over one little detail that you find and letting that blow up the deal, you step back and say, well, what, what can they do for me in the big picture? And can they make my life better and my music more valuable with how, what they can do with it in the, in the, in the scale of what they can do with it? Oh, um, Taylor, why did you bring that up when we have nine minutes left? I like want to do a whole show about, <laughs> <laughs> I want to do a whole show about like these microsync companies licensing to big because that changes the whole game if microsync companies start licensing music to to mcdonald's you know like that's a whole different game and uh but we, that's a camp convo camp <laughs> conversation. for yeah, real that, like, that's it's hard man it's hard to see that and honestly it, it, you and, and if i had the choice i think music bed's a really really great uh champion of trying to keep that maintain that value but again you look at artlist's model and you have to respect them for what they're doing and how much money they're pumping into the indie community but yeah like i, I mean i could talk about this for for days <laughs> it's crazy yeah i got uh, oh my God. Go ahead. I, I just want to get the other side of that i appreciate what you're saying but just to keep things really fair and balanced like we do in this room i think it's important to say they definitely are pumping money into the indie community. You can also look at it the other perspective of, you know, potentially devaluing like we're talking about or, you know, why would Hallmark pay $30,000 or $50,000 or any of those things to, you know, other artists if they can get your song for 50 cents, <laughs> you know, and, and if you're awesome, if they're getting, if I'm getting Dirage, you know, for 50 cents or I, even if I can get Dirage for a hundred dollars, um, you know, does that devalue him for other placements or does it make him more valuable because now he's proven that he can be used uh, or so, excuse, sorry, not you, Diraj, but your songs are valuable to these shows. Yeah, you but know? they shouldn't so. be getting Diraj royalty free. I on agree. TV because that, that is <laughs> performance royalties. Do, I absolutely third. agree. I think that we know where I stand on this side of things, but I just want to make sure that we're bringing that up to the room that, Again, we're not endorsing any one way or, you know, one way of life. And I think what was really great uh, about, you know, what Taylor was saying is the approach of saying if somebody does kind of screw you over like that, instead of just blowing up the bridge, use that as leverage to go back to that company and say, hey, you did this thing. It's not the best for our community. It wasn't the best for me. How can we improve it for all of our sakes in a very human and polite kind of way? But also... Be responsible enough to know if you sign a contract, you can't go getting pissed off, you know, at the company if you gave them the right to do something. You have to know, you know, what you're doing when you get into these things. I, I do want to say this too. During the pandemic, these platforms, these sync platforms, the micro sync, but music bed, art list, soundstrike, all of they came through in the clutch because there was, man, all you did was have time to create. But when payout hit, like Artlist pays up, literally, they pay out probably the week before Christmas. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm not going to say what my amount was, but when it came through at random, I was like, this is, oh, man, this made 2020, like, I was cool. 
<laughs> I love that it created opportunities. I'm curious, Tech, how many artists, or if anybody wants to take this one, do you think that you are the exception or the rule for a, a platform like this? That I'll kick it to kick, and then if anybody else has a thought on it. That is actually a very good question. And I'm going to marinate on that for just a moment. Somebody else. Let me, let me jump in on that. Um, I, I say, you know, to your point, Steph, about value, right? I think that the, the microsync, you know, is akin to Napster, LimeWire, and depending on who you're asking of what it means for the music industry, right? Um, some people would have an argument of how it's, you know, destroying it, and other people have an argument of how it's spreading it and growing it. And then, of course, what happened is the industry transitioned to these DSPs, and now we just have a whole different business model. So I think, you know, there's valuable points on both sides. But what I will say, something that Kick alluded to earlier, um, something like microsync, specifically, let me say this, specifically for the genre of hip hop, opens up a whole nother door to a genre, a style, a culture, and race of people that don't normally get included in these opportunities at all. And the ability to literally uh, be on these platforms and be um, pushed out internationally uh, without having to go through a label, without having to go, if you're thinking a traditional artist route and hip hop is different than every other one because a lot of other genres, you got you know cover bands and different ways you can get paid, but in hip hop it's so much harder for artists and producers to get out there and to get revenue in general. And they end up just spending, spending, spending so much money. And this, in my opinion, provides a unique opportunity for them to be on the equal playing field with you know, people who have music in TV shows and movies and get uh, internationally loans. So I would say, you know, um, it's always gonna vary depending on who you are, but me, for example, without the history and the, and the resources and the connections that maybe a kick hat, um, to be able to do what I'm doing from Chicago, which I know a lot of people think of Chicago in this way, but it's in middle America. We don't have a music industry here. We have great music history, but we don't have a music industry. And I, I would imagine kick would feel the same way about you know, Cincinnati. That just opens the door. And I think that that is the benefit for most people or independent artists in this space. That's really well said. I, let me. I'm gonna put a pause on this convo because we really could go into this. But I'm gonna. Sorry, we, guys. Oh, uh, I, one second. I, I was just saying sorry for for, for starting. Oh no, nah, man, nah, <laughs> no, no, it was all good. It really, really, no, so really like was man. great. But I'm gonna. We're gonna invite all of you back on the first um, Wednesday of May, which is, is that next week. Um, because we normally do our campfire conversations, and now I know this is exactly part of what we're going to want to talk about. We do kind of just convo about regular stuff, and we're definitely going to make like deep, you know, the, the whole debate whether devaluing or increased opportunity or increased opportunity at the expense of a devaluing. I think that's a, a very worthwhile convo. So let's put a pause in it here. If you're available next week, is that is next week the first week of May? Or or yeah, we have one more Cinco de Mayo too. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So bring your margarita, bring your margarita, and we'll have the we'll have the convo uh, next Wednesday evening. But let's uh, let's let's uh, close closed handwriting. We got five more questions, so we're gonna knock them out, and then we will transition. And if anybody wants to hang out with us, we have our after party. Uh, click on the greenhouse above my picture if you're not already following Control Camp, and the after party will show up. We we'll spend another hour over there talking about everything other than music. Uh, and anybody can come up on stage. We just get to know each other, like hanging out at the bar after a TEDx. So, um, but let's get through these uh, remaining five, starting with Mickey. Yo, what's going on, guys? How we doing? Um, good to see Money Cat and hear Money Cat. And, of course, all you guys, Steph, Diraj, Eric. My question is um, a hip-hop-based one. Uh, so I know it's pretty much a no-no in general for um, just sampling and, and, and stuff like that. We got to you know keep it clean, make it as uh, easy for everybody. But I was just wondering with the, the way that I understand some of these usages work, like, YouTube, they have their whole content ID and 
um, just other places, maybe like an internal video for a company or a training video. They want to license some music and put it to that. Um, how do they relate with samples? Because I just made some fire hip hop that is sample based. And I'm like, dang, I'm only going to be able to use this for my own personal uses. But how does the micro syncing world relate to samples? Is it any different from the rules of the game for all other sync purposes? Good question, Mickey. Kick, I see you open. They won't, they won't touch it. They won't even deal with it. If you got a sample in there and you ain't got it, even if you got it cleared, they won't touch it because there's it still puts them at risk of getting dinged from you know you primarily YouTube. YouTube's where a lot of people, like a lot of YouTube creators and you know brands or whatnot, they publish a lot of their marketing on YouTube because it's a revenue generator for them too for those views. So the moment YouTube glitches or does something, say hey ding and they can't get any type of documentation that states that they got that song that sample cleared then that's a strike that's a permanent strike and youtube is three strikes you're out so if you was making millions and they cancel your uh, youtube account it's over your million dollars gone awesome answer awesome answer all right um uh, alex Hey guys, thanks for the info tonight. Um, Kick spoke a little bit about his approach to getting accepted on platforms, and I thought that was super thoughtful. Are you guys taking a different approach in terms of workflow, writing and producing timelines, et cetera, for what you choose to write or submit for micro sync versus regular sync versus artist projects? Good questions coming. Thanks, Alex. Anybody want, uh, no more than two people, any, two, any one or two people want to jump on asking, does your workflow change for micro sync and how you approach writing for it? Or is, do you approach all your sync writing the same? <laughs> I think we were both trying to jump in at the same time. I'll, I'll speak to it. Um, my writing approach doesn't necessarily change for me. I think I'm still trying to bring like, you know, myself, what do I think, you know, kind of is needed in the market? You know, what is marketable? Um, I might prioritize some of my catalog to, you know, one of these sites just for my personal um, strategy at this particular moment. But I like to diversify. So I have kind of just different parts of my catalog in different spaces um, and in different hands. And so, um yeah I, I, for me it hasn't really changed my process um i'm always kind of looking how i can increase my output but that's about it can i jump in on that too sure, um, thank you um i i want i was i'm so glad that you brought that up Duraj. um or that this question was asked and that that you just said what you said Duraj, because while writing differently um for microsync versus normal bigger sinks doesn't have to change or be any different. Um, I do have artists that I work with where some of their music is just like in the bag, works perfectly for advertising. We go after big brand campaigns with those songs, but then they'll have this other body of music that's more authentic to maybe like a different artist project or, um, you know, traditionally isn't going to fall in like, for example, the ad space in terms of like what common needs are there. So they'll diversify like Daraj was saying and put some of their music with Musicbed and then sign other songs with sync companies and be a bit surgical in that way. Um, and I really love it when my artists do that because I like seeing my artists be able to win on the micro sync side and capitalize on that income, but then also be selective and personally pitch and represent their music for the bigger stuff. So um, yeah, I just wanted to throw that in as a thing. No, that was a really good point. I think psychosis touched on it as well, because sometimes there are, cause you know, a lot of these companies as well, um, they like artists who kind of have a front facing brand as well. And so that's something to kind of keep in mind, not to say that that's always the case, but usually it seems like they like when, you know, cause they, they kind of pitch it from the angle of these are this is music from real artists you're using real artist music it's not just like some you know no name or somebody you just haven't heard of before 
or just doesn't exist, you know, in the public eye. Um, and so it's useful in that regard. Um, but yeah, so I, I think, you know, and also some of the catalog that you have, some songs might have a little bit more chance on this side than, you know, like what Jaden was saying, you know, with the ad or whatever, you know, it's just because the, the usage type is just different. I, I feel like micro sync can be a little bit more subjective because you're getting people from everywhere with, you know, kind of all kind of budgets. And so, you know, it's a little bit of a catch all um, in that regard. So I, I will say that um, it, it, it can be a little bit more enticing because, you know, some of the songs that we kind of, you know, throw against the wall or we kind of put in a category like this is a sync song. You know, you put it on, you know, our list of a music bed and it might perform well, even though it's, it doesn't have the same, you know, you know, it's not hitting all the marks of what a sync song should. You know, that's why we always we always prioritize, say, just make dope music and it'll find its place. You know, what I mean, at the end of the day, that should always be the goal. Um, but micro sync may have a little bit more leeway with themes and all that kind of stuff. But some, but they still look for the, you know, kind of some of the traditional sync themes. But, you know, there's a little bit more room in that space. So Sorry, that was longer than I thought it was going to be. No, really, really great. OK, uh, three more questions left. Nick is next. Hey, everybody. Thanks. Um, and that last little conversation, I think, helped helped me a little bit in, in my question. But really, I'm kind of looking for validation in the sense that I, I'm fairly new to the sync world, been a musician for a long time, but uh, primarily a singer-songwriter, performing singer-songwriter. And then with sync, I'm, I'm doing more instrumental um, composing uh, and kind of different sound of things. Anyway, the question is more related to, I've been reaching out to um, videographers, ad agencies that are local to my my geographic area like so i would consider these probably smaller if they needed music smaller sync micro sync kinds of uh, arrangements and i'm just trying to validate if that and that's my kind of a direct approach i'm taking because i'm just trying to build a portfolio of some early placement stuff and i think micro sync is maybe a way as i'm starting out to gain some early momentum uh for for some i don't want to say quick placements but some placements uh, that I can then build a portfolio upon, and then from there, maybe I'm using one of these uh, sites, uh, Artlist or, or Music Better or anything like that, and or you know really trying to do more direct relationship stuff for bigger sync. So you're as asking to validate whether going yeah, is to that, direct. Is that like an approach that's worthwhile to just get started? I, I feel like I just need to get some placements under my belt to then be able to build off of that. So I feel like the micro sync world might be okay. a place let's to let, do um, that. Let's let Kick jump in there because he's done direct stuff. I don't know if it's with any small agencies, but you, have, you do brands too. Um, what would you say to that, Kick? So, and Nick, my advice to you would actually be something that I do kind of already. It actually has been helping me grow more and more is source your own there's stock videos out there create your own advertisement take your own music put it to some video mess with just go to iMovie or something like you know premiere or whatever splice it up together and show like hey this is what you know i've done for myself it doesn't have to be anything big because i pitch it sometimes say hey i saw something you did i put this video together from some stock images and they'll hit me back like, man, that's really good. Like, you know, what other music do you have? And then boom, end up landing more opportunities. So sometimes you got to go a little above and beyond to get those opportunities. Hey, I'm going to steal that idea. That's dope, bro. <laughs> Kick, we're going to have a whole separate room with you on just pitching, direct pitching strategies. That's pretty dope. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, By the way, I just want to, you know, say one thing about that, too. First of all, Kick, what Kick just said is good for sync across the board. It's also good for scoring. It's what is highly recommended for new scoring um, folks. But especially if you're trying to learn, that's a great way. But to your point there and kind of to the broader point of your question, um, Nick, is if I'm looking for a new artist or a new, you know, vendor or songwriter, I don't know how you got your placements. So if I see, maybe you are getting micro syncs, you know, and maybe you only got $179 to be on this like, you know, big brand or something. I don't know where you got that from. So 
you could definitely use that as a tool to A, show your work, and B, it's going to give you credibility. And again, I'm not endorsing this path, but I'm just speaking honestly. How do I know? If I look at Daraj's page, I don't know if he got a sync through a micro sync or if you got a TV show through a music supervisor or anybody. So it all just looks great to me, you know, just as the buyer, I can tell you that. Placement is a placement is a placement. That's right. Very dope. All right. Two more. Adrian. Hey, um, so I, uh, kind of been in and out. Um, I was, uh, getting my son ready for bed. Um, but, uh, so this may have been answered, but uh, with dealing directly with content creators, um, uh, with music that is on your that's with your PRO, how do you ensure that they don't get dinged? And um, is there any possibility for any back end in those situations? We talked a little about the back end. So, so these types of situations, there's no back end and there's no dinging from the PRO, as long as you, now if you've signed that music with an exclusive library or something, then you'll get dinged from there. But just if you've just registered your song with BMI or ASCAP or CSAC or any other PRO, just if it's in regist- being registered, then that in and of itself is not going to cause a problem. These particular companies we're talking about um, don't, shouldn't have any conflict with a registered songs. I see Taylor lit, lit up. So you want to, you have something to add to that? Yeah. Well, one thing that I, I do want to make aware of before you get into any situation with any of these uh, houses is to know that for Artlist, for example, if you bring a project over to Artlist, uh, they're very specific on, they have content ID rights in perpetuity. So if you bring your, you know, licensing over from Artlist and you're not satisfied, you want to bring it over to Musicbed or if you want to bring it over to a boutique house um, that does work with like the YouTube space, they can't monetize your rights in the content ID world um, because it does come across with that situation of dinging um, because then you'll have, you know, Artlist dinging and then you'll have Musicbed dinging and then it all start to cancel out and, and cause a, a huge ripple. So just be aware of whatever house you sign to. If content ID is a really important thing for you, which will become a, a real important player over the next couple of years, is that just know that your, your content ID rights are with that company, with those specific songs. Now, if you create more songs beyond that, then those songs will not be with Artlist or Musicbed or whoever. It'll, you know, you have new rights now, fresh rights. You can now sign off. That's, yeah, I, I think... That's actually a great point. And it's also in bigger than microsync, it's pretty much an industry wide problem, in my opinion, because any if you sign with a non exclusive library these days, an exclusive library, if you upload to Song Trader, even within C D Baby, a lot of these companies are giving you the option to track your content ID or and then once you have it with one is going to conflict with you doing your own music or trying to put out release your yeah. own CD or anything like it's just an industry problem that doesn't have a solution yet. And um, one, yeah, Daraj. My bad, Eric. I would say one thing. I was going to say I've actually gotten to the habit now. If I know there's a a song that I want to kind of push to the DSPs, um, you know, say like a distro kit or whatever, um, they will give me an option if I want to, you know, do YouTube content ID tracking or whatever. I, I've now gotten to the habit of not checking that just because if I have plans to put that on like a, a music bed, then I already know like they're going to handle that portion of it and they're going to ask me to, you know, remove it anyway. You know what I mean? Um, from that distributor um, so that they can control it for those body of songs. This is something I actually want to share real quick. So Deride, Psychosis and others that you know, how we use these sync platforms and it's kind of difficult to find these placements. You know, we know as long as we do our back end, there is a way to track it. And I use a website called tunesat.com and it allows you to upload your music and put in your PRO information or the metadata information and it scans every single network, TV channels globally. And it's actually been very beneficial for me because I've been able to find a lot of that micro sync stuff that I just don't know where it's at. So I just wanted to share that. 
It's a great no, resource. That's real good. Tune Zap. Yeah. Z A P S A T. Sat. Yeah. T U N. Oh, sweet. Thank you. That's fantastic. Yeah, and a lot of people use that, not just microsync, but music libraries, people who work with international music libraries, because it takes, you know, like six months to a year or more to get your royalties back. But you can find out if you've got placements a lot sooner. Uh, that's a great site. Thanks for thanks for shouting that out, Cake. Um, all right, Jay, you got the last question. Hey, I wanted to start by saying thanks again to Control Camp for another incredible session. I've been trying to dive deeper into the microsync world. And then I'm in here and see, you know, someone from my hometown of Cincinnati excelling in it. So it's just been inspirational. Um, my question comes from like the opposite side of the table of your music beds and your art lists. And I wanted to know what your guys' thoughts were on platforms such as Breaker for micro syncing. Um, technically, it's the opposite version, but I just want to know your thoughts on platforms like that. Uh, just as, for those who aren't, for, ex, I've heard of Breaker, but um, it's kind of new. So, why do you why are you saying that as a microsync platform? I, I uh, essentially, it, yeah, it's kind of new, but it's where you know artists can go and connect with influencers who have massive audiences, and you can pitch your music, and they name a price and say five bucks to be in my Instagram reel, and I have seven hundred fifty thousand followers. So you can pitch your music for $5, and if it's accepted, then that $5 is charged. If it's not accepted, you don't get charged anything. But it's it's another way of getting your music in front of a lot of people. So I was just kind of trying to see what your guys' thoughts were. Very on. cool. I've been Bye. getting, I've been seeing their ads recently, and I'm just reading a little bit about them, but I, I didn't know how the pitching process works. So I appreciate you sharing that. Does anybody on the stage have any experience with a breaker or any similar company? We, uh, we we did submit hub with TikTok. Um, what are they influencers? influencers. <laughs> yeah, we did a campaign like that, and um, I would say that they're really cool, but you have to pay them to use your song, and also you really just have to make sure that their audience is going to be receptive to your like. Are they your demographic too? You know because. You can get somebody with 5 million followers and pay them 70 bucks and they'll put your song in one of their videos. Is it even that much? Eh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It's not, it's, it's attainable. We did, we did a campaign through them. Yeah, but they might, they might be like, um, I don't know, for example, like, I don't know. What's a good we example? We had one, we had one guy use it and he was like a little kid's like thing. So we got all these reposts on TikTok of like, like little kids in like Southeast Asia, and like when I say little mouthing kids, along. I, I mean, mean like, like four year olds, three year olds, four year olds. They do not know what Spotify is. It's not going to translate to sales or fans in any way, but it did get a little bit of engagement, but it's like, that's um, kind of disposable. Like it kind of goes away really fast. If you don't really target it and go like, you have to do the math on that. Like, what is it worth? Because if you're going to reach millions of people, they have to be the right people. That's yeah. might great. Yeah. And we, the real way to do it, which is probably another conversation for another day, is get a big company to sync, to license your stuff to that's use. That's what you got to do. That's, what we, that's yeah. what we try to do. We got, we got two big companies to license our song for their TikTok campaign, and then they paid influencers to use our song. So we got money and we got the exposure. Oh, we're going to have to, you're going to come back and talk about that. Come on now. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, we used Submit Hub um, for one of the uh, projects we had. And um, I, I would say the same thing. Like we, we saw, you know, not a ton, you know, I, what you would expect. You know, if somebody has millions of followers, you know, you're kind of thinking that's going to translate really well. Um, but it's not always the case. And so it is kind of one of those things to do the research. Like, who is it that's pushing your music? Um and will it really translate and convert to your, you know, to to whatever that conversion that makes sense for you, whether it's money, whether it's streams, whether it's followers, whatever. Um, but one thing I will say is that there is a lot of power in a lot of these micro scene companies and this content creator influence world we have because, and this is one thing I'll encourage everybody, if you are putting your songs on one of these, I would, it's probably a, a in most cases, 
good to put your music up on like these DSPs before it goes live on those sites or coordinate the release dates because um, we had a song that did really well on uh, on Musicbed and we didn't have the the song out. We had you know people finding us on IG and stuff like ask for a song or whatever, but we went on YouTube and found that there are other people who liked the song so much and uploaded that song to their account. And they had like over like, you know, somehow like a hundred K listens on it. And it's just like, that's, you know, streams that we missed out on had we had just had it on our platform, our YouTube page, because it was, you know, a big interest there. Um, so it's kind of a lesson learned, but you just never know. Cause you can just have a song that does really, really well. And, you know, everybody, you know, upload, you know, they, they have permission to just kind of upload and you might miss out on at least that type of return when it comes to engagement, um, you know, for your brand. So just one thing I want to throw out there. That happened to us once, too. And we'll never forget our first bootleg. It felt like a rite of passage. <laughs> yeah. uh, someone we know suggested an artist in Italy we were talking to said that he, he I don't know how this would work. So someone might be able to take this and, and learn from it. But he actually submits his stuff to his to his DSP when he sends them to the sync agencies and they're kind of like in limbo, like he doesn't put the release date. And then if it gets it, or he puts the release date for five years, five years away. And then if it does come through, he releases it as a single through his artist project. Or if he misses it, um, like once it's in the DSP and it's in the system, it'll be discoverable on Shazam. So they won't be able to hear it on Spotify, but they'll be able to know that it's you. Yeah. And you'll so that's be able maybe to an idea that that worth exploring. Is getting interest and then maybe you release it you know very cool so many i love how this conversation has just given birth to so many other conversations that we need to have so, so this is just awesome um all right so we went a little over but this but and it is all good because it's for good reason and just really good information so um you have been hanging with us on control camp we've been talking since uh for the last two hours and 20 minutes about micro sync and this you know syncing music to um micro in you know uh micro placements like youtube podcasts etc uh we've been we're grateful that we had psychosis kickly uh, money cat taylor matthews all joining us sharing their experiences uh the variety of experiences uh that they that that they participate in the micro sync and it's been really enlightening. So I want to thank all of you for uh, just kind of spending these hours here with us and just being really open, really transparent. And that just the, our community is just better for it. So thank you all for that. Uh, and uh, Dara, Steph, any party words? Well, I would say if you loved everything you were hearing, um, don't forget to invite some people to the camp. There's really great stuff coming up. And, you know, to echo what you were just saying, Eric, it's really great that we were able to get these amazing artists on the stage. So if you enjoyed what they were saying, give them a follow. Psychosis, Kick, Money Cat, Taylor. Show them a little love and jump into other rooms that they're, you know, doing outside of ours. So just give them a follow. Show them some appreciation. Absolutely. I think... Um... I couldn't have asked for a better panel here to, to talk through this specific side of the industry. I mean, I think everybody is just there. They hold their weight as far as experience and just knowledge and wisdom on how to maneuver it. And this is, you know, I just reinforce this is just one area that, you know, we kind of, you know, have prioritized or, you know, use when it comes to sync licensing. There's many different ways that um, you can find success in this industry. And this is just highlighting one area. Um, but I, I'm just super thankful for everybody, you know, who's here. I mean, you know, Taylor's first time and then, you know, a couple of regulars with kick and psychosis and money cat, um, even money cat coming back from the last, um, uh, panel that we had, we just really, really appreciate you all. It's just invaluable information. Cool. You guys are the best. Yeah. No, yeah, no, we're just thankful. We're so thankful. All right. So with this, is how we transition, we are going to close this room down. If you're not able to hang, we just appreciate that you came here. If you're following us, then the after party will show up in um, your hallway. If you're not following us and you want it, want to see it, then come click on the greenhouse that's above my picture where it says control camp. And then there's a little green icon. Click on that and hit follow. Um, and then the after party should should show up. Um, and we don't talk sync there. It's just, it's like, you know, hanging out at the bar after 
you know, a TEDx or something. We just kind of get to know each other. And if you want to come up on stage, we don't pull we don't pull anyone up automatically. Just raise your hand, and anyone whose hands raised can come up and talk. So um, we'll see some of you over there and uh, get to know you. Otherwise, thank you all so much. We really appreciate you. Have a, a good night. Deuces. Bow, 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 bow. Salute, salute. Night, guys. Thanks, Thanks again. Guys. You guys are the best. Night.